Hello, everyone, and welcome to day two of the Summer Summit. Uh, I will see more than 270 participants that are on right now. So thank you for joining us. It's great to see uh, folks from different parts of the world, uh, from New Zealand to Japan to Southeast Asia, uh, here in the US, Latin America. So welcome, everyone. It's great to see you here. Uh, today is the second day of the Summer Summit. Day one was uh, our IoT and real estate and construction programs. We had amazing speakers and great startups, the conclusion of the last course of those programs. Um, earlier today, we had our mobility session, uh, an amazing lineup of startups in autonomous, shared, connected, and electric mobility. Uh, and we announced some of our partners uh, that we work with, uh, some of the automakers, OEMs, tier one suppliers and, and the major players in the transportation space that we work with. And I'm very thrilled to inform you that we run all these four programs of IoT real estate, energy, and mobility under the umbrella of smart cities in order to maximize the value of our ecosystem for, uh, for the startups, corporate partners, and all parties involved. So as for the energy session today, uh, we'll start with a keynote session by Sergey Manovsky, the head of digital innovation and growth at Edison International, one of the largest uh, utilities in Southern California. We're very excited to have Sergey here today and we'll have, uh, following that, a fireside chat with our CEO, Saeed Amidi, and Barbara Berger, uh, the president of Chevron Technology Ventures. Uh, really thrilled to have them both here, some of the leaders in, in the energy transition, oil and gas and tech space to hear you know, how they manage uh, the world through these challenging times and on their new roles. So in the end, we'll be announcing our batch six uh, corporate award winner of the energy program after the follow up, after the startup presentations. And then we'll follow that with a, a networking session. And this big QR code you can see here, you can take your phone out, take a quick snap of it and join our networking session, virtual networking session afterwards. So our startups and our corporate partners uh, are making themselves available to meet and, and uh, learn a little bit about you. So for better context, to those of you who are not familiar with plug and play, um, our job here is effectively to find and invest in startups and pair them up with the partners in our VC and corporate network. And over the past uh, six or seven years, I'd say we've built one of the largest ecosystems that are out there to help foster innovation. And what really drives our business is the success of entrepreneurs in our portfolio. We as a firm review about 5,000 startups every year and invest in about 150 to 200 of them. So we are usually the first checks in. So in pre-seed, seed and pre-series A rounds and then help these startups with the follow on rounds of investments and business development. And we look forward to investing in, in more entrepreneurs who can help some of the world's systemic challenges. In addition to our investment practice, is thanks to our corporate partners that we're able to build the largest corporate innovation platform that's now more than 30 offices globally to help foster innovation. So we run more than 50 industry themed innovation programs through which we provide a non-equity requirement opportunity for both early and mature startups to participate, engage, and hopefully land some of these large corporations as their clients. So we feel energy industries is in the midst of an energy evolution and are excited to be working with some of the world's sector leaders in oil and gas and utilities. And the main objective here is to help them look into their assets and make them more efficient and sustainable. And in addition to that, we join them in their energy transition journey to, to diversify their assets from fossil fuels and invest in more emerging markets like distributed energy resources energy storage, renewables, electric mobility, smart cities, and adjacent industries. And we're really thrilled to be working with partners across Thailand, China, Japan, Europe, here in the US. And very recently, we brought on board some of the leaders in the Latin American energy market. So we last week, we had a fireside chat with Dr. Felipe Bayon, the CEO of EcoPetrol, announcing our partnership. And of course, uh, with the two new partners that joined our energy practice are Copic, one of the largest Chilean fuel retailers that are looking to 
transform their business in the next 10 to 15 years and make six investments a year uh, through their win ventures arm, as well as Gerdao, one of the largest steel manufacturers of Brazil that joined us uh, in this journey. So really excited to have the new partners on board and look forward to seeing you in the next uh, few uh, months and years. So on behalf of the energy team, I really like to thank our partners. You know, you sharing your case studies, success stories, innovation roadmap, participating in the board meeting, dictating the focus areas have been tremendously helpful for us to navigate through these, uh, you know, industry transformation and, and really help each other to come out strong and, and help the entrepreneurs scale their solutions and do a proof of concept or a pilot project to validate their solutions. And, and with the shared objective of having some sort of live commercial product in the market. So really, thank you. And we're, we can't wait to have you back when the situation is better and, and we can have in-person meetings again. Uh, so a, a big shout out to you and, and our team to be able to do this. It's needless to say that the world has changed. As of today, we have more than 7.8 million confirmed COVID cases. And it was just a few days ago that we had a similar session and the, the number was 7.2. So the number is uh, increasing and, and entrepreneurs, corporations, regulators, and business owners, they're all facing very big challenges. And uh, you know, we as Plug and Play, I'm, I'm really proud to be a part of Plug and Play. We run a dedicated program that can help the startups that are targeting some of these solutions uh, that can solve the, the issues caused by the coronavirus uh, spread. So the four kind of practices underneath these COVID-19 accelerator programs are supply chain, health, enterprise, and commerce. So if you're an entrepreneur uh, trying to solve some of these challenges, if you're a corporation or if you're an investor trying to help with this movement, please join us. And we as Plug and Plays have committed to subsidize the cost for partners here and, and help run more dedicated programs for these issues. So with that brief overview, I want to introduce our keynote speaker of today. Dr. Sergey Minovsky leads Edison International's growth and innovation team, which is focused on early stage investments, partnerships, and strategic collaboration in clean energy, electric mobility, grid edge, and customer choice. Sergey previously served as the director of the utility of the future team at Consolidated Edison and was the head of energy and sustainability for the city of New York under Mayor Michael Bloomberg and an adjunct professor at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. Sergey, thank you for joining us. Over to you. The stage is yours. Thank you, Wade and Saeed, for the opportunity to kick things off for the annual Energy Expo today. Our team has always enjoyed this event, and we're looking forward to hearing the startup pitches today. And we're just going to have to figure out how to do everything virtually. Uh, our theme today is innovation during challenging times. Uh, over the past several years, California has faced its share of challenges, including historic droughts, mudslides, wildfires, and along with the rest of the world, the COVID pandemic. Uh, I'm going to highlight a couple of our stories in our innovation journey. And many of the companies in the room, who particularly those who operate critical infrastructure, um, I'm sure will have similar experiences. Uh, my intention is to reach out to this community of startups and innovators and invite you to work with us. So uh, I'm with Edison International, uh, which is a parent company uh, of Southern, Southern California Edison. So SCE is the investor and utility that serves roughly 50 million residents across 50,000 square miles of Southern California. We also own Edison Energy, which provides energy advisory services to large CNI customers who are looking to meet sustainability goals and manage their energy costs and, and risks across their facilities. Um, my role is uh, I lead our growth and innovation team. So we scout for new technologies and, and business models and manage an early stage venture program uh, really for the strategic purpose of, of meeting our clean energy and electrification goals. So as an energy company that operates a grid, uh, the most immediate innovation challenge has been keeping 13,000 employees operating at a high level under the stay-at-home orders. Uh, while safely operating the grid, that's become even a bigger part of our daily lives uh, and also continuing to do the essential work for this year's wildfire season. Uh, for a sense of scale, if our service territory were its own state, it would be the fifth largest in the U.S. by population. Um, 
So like many organizations, particularly those that are over 100 years old, uh, we were an in-the-office culture. Uh, within days, we moved two-thirds of our workforce, uh, over 8,000 people, from the office to work at home. Um, we've had a volunteer group of essential SCE personnel um, actually sequestered on site at our critical facilities to support grid operations. In many cases, they've been uh, away for 30 days without their families, without any visitors. Uh, we've also needed to keep our repair, repair crews working out in the community uh, to prepare for fire season and other critical work uh, with the right safety precautions and new approaches to physical distancing between crew members. And to give you a sense of the complexity uh, of our service territory, there are 88 local governments here. Uh, and in the early days of the pandemic, our teams developed new operational approaches to ensure that we could continue the critical work without minim with minimal dis uh, disruption of customers. Um, you know, what I've, what I've taken uh, from this experience, and this is with the luxury of being one of the office workers now working from home, uh, is not only the sacrifices that many of our employees have made, but the importance of organizational speed and agility. Um, the, um, our, our CEO, Pedro Pizarro, uh, has hosted weekly live streams with our entire company. Uh, it's been welcoming tough questions from all parts of the business. You know, rather than only having a kind of a top-down approach, uh, he's encouraged a, a difference of opinion and inclusiveness. I think it's been a very powerful uh, leadership model. <clears throat> um, that focus has extended to our customers and our business partners and our supply chain. You know, SE was one of the first utilities to voluntarily suspend service disconnections and, and waive late fees um, uh, for, for customers impacted by, by COVID. This is before it was mandated. Uh, we've also worked with many of our vendors to offer you know, prepayment of services for programs that are currently on hold. So, uh, you know, the last three months we've seen innovation really born of necessity, uh, in some cases facilitated by technology but primarily enabled by anticipating customer needs and, and the safety of our, our customers and our employees. So as we start <clears throat> looking beyond the immediate crisis to the longer term um, new normal, uh, we still want to perform the same service uh, and, and have the same role in the community, but we're also thinking more broadly, like many organizations here, uh, about how we think about productivity and collaboration, uh, wellness in, in the broadest sense, uh, new approaches to safety, uh, frankly, we're seeing some of the most uh, intriguing approaches are coming from, you know, well outside uh, the energy sector. Uh, here at Plug and Play, to mention a few that, that we've had line of sight on, uh, you know, health, enterprise tech, IoT, real estate. So uh, what I'm most excited about this week, uh, uh, Wade, uh, is to, to help break down some of the silos here and, and hear from you all. Uh, we certainly don't have all the answers. So, uh, Turning to our, our longer-term vision, um, which, which is to lead the clean energy transformation of our, our industry and, and, and help car California reach its carbon neutrality goals by 2045, uh, my central message to the startup community here at Plug and Play is that our goals and targets haven't changed. And in fact, we, we think it's more important than ever to engage with you. Um, you know, climate change is very real to us. Uh, as many of you know, uh, 10 of the 20 most destructive California wildfires in recorded history have happened since 2015. After years of heat and drought, the devastation has been heartbreaking uh, to, to many communities. Uh, in addition to that, just as a reference, in 2017, the, the California wildfires uh, released nearly as many greenhouse gases as the entire electricity sector. Um, so we're going to have to simultaneously address both climate adaptation and resilience along with uh, mitigation. Uh, so we have a program that's been focused on hardening the grid, uh, vegetation management, situational awareness, uh, and overhead inspections. And uh, the, the input from the startup community has been uh, tremendous in helping shake our thinking and, and think outside the box. Um, turning to our Pathways 2045 vision, uh, in 2018, California set aggressive targets to transition to 100% carbon-free retail electricity sales and achieve carbon neutrality by 2045. Uh, we, we looked across the entire economy at the most feasible and cost-effective ways to get there and laid out the steps needed to transform the way energy is produced and consumed in California. This was with the understanding that technologies and policies will, of course, evolve, and no model can really perfectly capture this. Um, the pillars to the plan are decarbonizing the power sector, electrifying a uh, significant portion of transportation in, 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 buildings, in the building sector, 
using natural gas and low carbon fuels such as hydrogen for hard to electrify segments such as heavy duty transportation and some industrial processes and ultimately ensuring that our grid is flexible, reliable, and resilient to enable this. The roadmap has powerful implications for the economic growth of the region and the new types of business models, uh, technologies, new ideas that are going to have to emerge in the coming years as a result. <clears throat> Transportation represents the largest opportunity, accounting for 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions pie. But it's really more than that. Air pollution is a quality of life and, and frankly, it's a social justice issue for millions in Southern California and lost work days, school days, ER visits, hospitalizations for respiratory and heart conditions. Uh, I remember growing up uh, as a kid with asthma here in L.A. Um, in, in addition, the majority of our disadvantaged communities are clustered along the major transportation routes where emissions from internal combustion engines significantly affect them. Our analysis shows that three out of four passenger vehicles will need to be electric, or roughly 26 million vehicles by 2045. We'll also need a substantial number of electric trucks, vans, and buses that currently we don't have at scale. So the, the, the scale of this transition is enormous. At the utility, we have a phenomenal e-mobility program that helps customers electrify through, through its charge-ready infrastructure deployment program, rebates, and educational programs. There is also a critical role for innovation outside the utility. And this has been a focus area for our venture program in recent years. Uh, our view is this, this, this is a perfect time for disruptive startups to shake things up. You know, as a couple of examples, uh, a number of years ago, we made an investment in electric bus manufacturer, uh, Proterra, which has helped usher in the era of e-buses in the North American market. Um, Ampli Power, which recently completed its Series A, uh, despite the economic headwinds, Two, two to three years ago was really just an idea and a PowerPoint present, presentation. Um, now it's well positioned to hopefully make a, an impact on the industry by giving fleet operators a simple package of solutions to electrify and reduce their operational and financial risk. There are undoubtedly many other opportunities. The industry is missing affordable medium duty electric trucks and vans across classes three through, through six. Uh, we're going to need faster, cheaper, and more convenient charging, better integration of vehicles with the grid. Uh, there's a tremendous uh, uh, opportunity here for, for innovators. So how is the energy system going to generate and deliver the electrons to customers? So with the shift away from fossil fuel consumption and greater energy efficiency, the total energy consumption actually decreases across the economy. But electricity demand actually increases by roughly 60% with the shift uh, to, to electric transportation and buildings. Uh, that's going to require an additional 80 gigawatts of utility scale generation from carbon free sources uh, such as solar and wind. In many cases, utilities will be the off takers of this power, but we're also seeing corporations increasingly committing to meeting their sustainability targets in, in part through their own clean energy purchases. Uh, as an example, last year, Edison Energy facilitated the largest clean energy procurement in automotive history on behalf of Honda, Honda Motor Company in the U.S., virtually uh, with a virtual power purchase agreement of uh, 320 megawatts of renewables, covering roughly 60% of their electric load in, in North America. Now, in order to balance these intermittent resources with demand, we're going to need about 30 gigawatts of energy storage on the system. Those are big numbers, but we believe they're achieve achievable, and we're starting to see the industry scale. For context, several weeks ago, uh, we announced a 770 megawatt procurement for storage, one of the largest in the nation to help meet local reliability needs caused by closure of once through cooling natural gas plants along the coast. You know, five of these are in the 100 megawatt club, which are among the largest in the world. You know, for, for comparison, there was just over 1,000 megawatts of total utility scale storage, battery storage on the entire U.S. grid uh, at the end of 2019. We also expect roughly half of single family homes in California to have rooftop solar, uh, driven by improved economics, building codes, supportive policies. This would be roughly 30 gigawatts of behind the meter solar, and in many cases paired with storage. What will the grid look like when we get out to 2045? What our pathways work shows us is that the most efficient route to decarbonize the economy is through the grid. We're in the early stages of looking out that far. It also means that customers are going to rely on the grid to deliver electricity to power more and more of their lives, not just lights, but now their heating and cooling and their transportation. And we're, you know, grow, 
customers are going to be increasingly sensitive to power quality issues as they're dependent on the internet and cell phone. We need to make sure the grid is efficient, available, reliable, and operates consistently across the service territory. Um, so we know that our energy supply will shift to more intermittent, <coughs> intermittent and inverter-based resources, which will mean that we need to consider system inertia issues, potential transmission constraints down the road. Um, the rate and location of customer adoption of technologies such as EV, solar, storage, and, and secular shifts in mobility patterns and regional demographics are going to shape are going to shape the grid. Uh, climate change will also impact the performance of equipment and create higher AC loads. And and also uh, customers will will need different types of uh, resilience uh, uh, protections uh, uh, in, in the future. So we're in the early stages of looking at the long term implications, but we know that grid decisions will need to be more autonomous, pushed to the edge, more responsive. The grid's going to be more modular, um, and, and cybersecurity will become even more critical. So putting all that together, what does that mean for the consumers and the economy and, and this group of innovators uh, here at Plug and Play? Well, the plan only makes sense if it's affordable to Californians, particularly the most vulnerable residents. Uh, the, the vision implies a, a generational commitment and investment. We've estimated it would take roughly $250 billion of investment and, and a range of clean energy resources and, and the grid over the next 25 years. If it's implemented properly, it could actually reduce the overall cost of energy for an average household. That's largely due to the inherent efficiency of uh, electric technologies over, over the thermodynamic limitations of fossil fuel combustion machines. Um, we, also, we also believe there is a tremendous economic opportunity here. Uh, and it's going to take investment across the economy, not only through the utilities, to make this happen. Uh, California currently has a strong clean energy economy, uh, more than half a million jobs when, when last counted in 2019. We, we believe there's going to be, this, this can be an economic engine for the state in the upcoming decades, creating thousands of jobs in clean energy resource development, energy management, grid construction, charging infrastructure, storage, R&D. So, you know, we're in a period of uncertainty right now in the economy and in, in the venture world. Uh, startups are managing their cash runways and investors are triaging their portfolios. Um, we've stress tested our own portfolio and our assumptions about the energy transition. Uh, we believe now more than ever we're looking to engage with this group. Um, you know, 10 to 15 years ago during the last economic uh, upheaval, the energy system, you know, looked very different and it wasn't one company uh, startup or otherwise that found the solution. It was hundreds of small innovations, product improvements, and hardware and software in ways that uh, couldn't have been predicted. And of course, scale uh, that brought us to where we are today. You know, at the time, solar and wind uh, were seen as costly, and energy storage uh, was more of a science pro project. So, uh, some thoughts for the, the startup community here. Um, don't be discouraged if an email or, uh, goes unanswered. Continue to find ways to, to showcase your value of your product or solution um, because what may not have been a priority last week may, may become a priority this week. Uh, and as the events of the past month have taught us, you never know what unique challenge may confront your organization tomorrow. Solutions that may not have been relevant to your industry may now be relevant. <clears throat> you know, for those startups working with utilities, and by the way, I know it's, I know it's not always easy. We're not the easiest customer. Um, Think hard about integration with other technologies and systems and shaping new open standards. The days of proprietary vendor standards are probably going to end. Um, help, help develop customer-facing solutions that, have, uh, that are clearly interoperable and, and benefit the grid. Uh, and also, don't underestimate cybersecurity. It's going to become a key requisite and differentiator for technology choices that utilities make. And for the other, <clears throat> for the other corporates at Plug and Play, I think this is a great opportunity for us to learn from each other and, and break down silos. I think we'll find the most interesting solutions coming from unexpected places. So our, our team is looking forward to connecting with you this week and, and continuing our work together. I'm, looking, I'm really looking forward to hearing the startup pitches. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sergey. It was a great overview of Edison International and thank you for your advice to our partners and to our startups. We are uh, equally excited to be able to work with you and great to hear the role of Edison uh, and, and what you're doing to modernize the grid and decarbonize our energy system. So, uh, Sergey has expressed interest to connect with you all if you're interested to connect with him afterward. 
uh, available in the network. So if anyone's in, interested in getting to know them, our next session is particularly exciting to me. Um, you know, we have our CEO, Saeed Amidi, uh, he's a serial entrepreneur and a, a veteran investor in the fireside chat with Barbara Berger, the president of Chevron Ventures. And as many of you know, Bob, uh, Chevron has been in the corporate venture capital for over 20 years. So I'm really excited to hear and learn today from this conversation. Um, with that, I want to turn it over to my colleague, Paya, to moderate. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction, Wade. Um, it's an honor to have Saeed and Barbara both with us during our summer summit. Chevron has been one of Plug and Play's anchor partners in our Houston program since last fall. On a personal note, uh, it's been fantastic working with the entire Chevron team and especially Scott Nelson over the past few months. Um, they're very highly engaged in our startup community. Um, just some housekeeping for this fireside chat. We've got about 45 minutes allotted. Um, we will take questions from the audience the last 10 to 15 minutes. So if you have a question, make sure to put it in the Q&A box below. Um, there's a chat box and a Q&A box. Make sure to use the Q&A box uh, because that's the one we'll be monitoring. And uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to uh, Saeed and Barbara to introduce herself. Thank you so much. Saeed and Barbara, feel free to turn on your cameras. I am trying to turn on my camera. I can see Barbara. Well, I guess I'll have to go solo. Oh, there you are. No, there we go. Uh, Barbara, it's great having you. I really hope that we, this could be in person, but we have to learn how to work, uh, you know, virtually and digitally. But I, I am very thankful that you could join us today. And perhaps for some of the audience uh, that do not know Chevron Venture, can you tell us a little bit of history of it? Why did Chevron start this? And what, for example, is your metrics of success uh, last year, this year? Okay, so first of all, um, hey, thanks for the invite. Um, um, and, you know, hopefully I'll uh, scratch the itch of a lot of the people in the audience. So uh, Chevron Technology Ventures was established 21 years ago. So the good thing is we had our 20th birthday party last year. Uh, March and we were able to do that live um, and it was formed you know we're a uh, Standard Oil of California right so we we're based in, in um, Northern California and it was formed by some I think pretty astute senior leaders in the company who had a concern that large companies have a tendency to look inside e either inside the company or inside our established suppliers for for the answers and the technology and innovation that we need to move our industry forward. And so they wanted to have a small part of their company that's primary remit was to focus outside the company and external to the company. And so the group was established. We did some of the things that um, others do when they form a corporate venture organization is we went out and talked to other groups that had been established. Um, we kind of learned from people who had already done this. Um, we used some of the industry associations to understand how they worked. And although we've worked on different things and different problem sets over that 20 years, and I've been fortunate enough to, to be the president for seven years, um, we've always been at the edge of innovation. We've always been thinking about the energy system and where is it going. So the, the actual opportunities have varied because innovation has changed and, and so forth. But, you know, it's always about how do, you, how do you access external innovation and integrate into, you know, the intersection with Chevron. And um, I've been very fortunate in my time that I have very supportive senior management because I think that's a, a, 
success factor. Um, and then, um, you know, we've, we have an incredible organization that um, explores all kinds of opportunities and we are not opportunity limited. Now you mentioned what are the success metrics. Um, so some of them look just like other Chevron businesses. So one, we want to keep everybody safe. Um, and you know, that's particularly important and we think about that during this time frame. Um, you know, we asked for certain resources from the company. So, you know, how well did we do on that? And then we look at a lot of opportunities and we commit to progressing a certain number of them. And we show the company how much more money Chevron made in its bottom line through the use of innovation. So it's, you know, it's not enough to just invest. I mean, that's a really important component to what we do, but we actually, for, for some of the companies, we see a use case today. And, um, you know, that, that's a key part of what we've done and we've worked hard on, on that model. Um, we also commit that we'll do a certain investments in certain areas. Um, and, um, you know, that's reflective of, of the pretty broad remit we have from an investment standpoint. Wonderful. And I guess I would just finish by saying, um, you know, we have a pretty good set of metrics and the team did really well last year and their bonuses reflect that. That's great. Good morning, our mobility expo where we featured 20 startups and majority of them were in battery technology, energy storage. And you know, as an energy provider, may I ask, do you also participate in electrification, EV technology? Is there a special sector of the industry that Chevron is looking into for growth? You know, specifically, I had Shell CEO with me about three weeks ago, and they were operating, this is Fabian from Shell, Germany. Mm -hmm. They were operating over 2,000 stations, and they are trying to convert some of the stations to charging stations, uh, other pickup and delivery packages. Do you invest out of the traditional energy business? And yeah, sure. Yeah, so it, we have over the time, and, and currently we have, um, we have a fund called the Future Energy Fund. And it has a dual remit, which is, I think, important when you think about what the sort of current or incumbent companies are doing in the energy transition. One of them is to lower the emissions of oil and gas. And so it's what we do in our own operations. And the second is to invest in, you know, breakthrough technology on low carbon value chains. Um, a little bit about mobility or transportation, you know, it is, so roughly 60% of, of oil goes into, the, into transportation, all, all forms. And then, I don't know, more than 90% of transportation is fueled by oil. So they're inextricably li linked right now. Um, and, and we obviously have seen that through COVID. Um, but we're looking at, you know, where is mobility going? Because we know that, you know, population is growing and people will, uh, outside of this current phenomenon, people will continue to move. And so you know, we're interested in the other forms, whether they be hydrogen, natural gas, you know, electrification. And, and so we made an investment in ChargePoint pretty early on. So ChargePoint, um, not, not that far from your Sunnyvale operation. And, you know, we, we wanted to understand a lot of things about electrification. Um, you know, first and foremost is, you know, is, is the infrastructure and the charging going to be a bottleneck or is it going to keep up and there's a different bottleneck towards electrification? Who makes money in all of that? And where do they make it and how do they make it? Where do people charge? Um, do you go big on service stations or do you realize that people will charge at their home and work? So it, there were more and more questions and investment is an options play and it allows us to learn and support 
what we thought was a pretty strong player in it. And, you know, we've had good relationship with them. So we're, we're experimenting with a number of pilots um, in our service stations and things like that. But I think there's a broader play to really understand how that's all going to unfold as electrification of transportation um, grows. You know, we pride ourselves in what we call open innovation. And in Germany, for example, even though Mercedes Daimler sponsored our initiative in Stuttgart, now we have Porsche, Volkswagen on the platform, BMW, and Bosch, and ZF, the tier one suppliers. You know, we kind of feel to really make a big impact, you have to have the whole value chain of an industry on a platform. Do you work with other competitors when you co-invest? And do you feel the industry needs to move together or separately? What is your thought on that? I heard you have over 100 portfolio companies. Who are yeah. some of your co-investors? Yeah, so and currently, we have a, over 175 co-investors. So um, I think one of the things that tells you is that we work with a lot of different players. We work with our peers. Um, almost, almost every oil and gas corporation, you know, the large ones, have a venture organization. And it, it, it may look slightly different than what we do, but there's a lot of overlap. So we work with them. We work with the industrials. Uh, we worked a lot with GE over the years. They were a very large investor. Uh, we work with, um, there are some venture funds solely focused on energy. So we work with some of them. Uh, financial investors, uh, there's some Sand Hill Road investors that we have um, invested with. We've also invested with family offices high net worth individuals. So it's a wide range. And I think that is something that is underappreciated is the role of being a good co-investor. And, uh, you know, we've been around for a long time and we continually improve our model, but we also, I think, have a pretty good reputation of being a good investor. And we'll help new co-investors or new investors, corporate corporate players that want to get into venture capital. And the reason why we do is that we want to have good co-investors. Bad co-investors are not a good thing. And I, you're an investor, so you know that. And so it is worth our time and worth our effort to talk about not only what we do, but how we do it with other companies. Um, because again, we want, you know, we see something in the innovation and we want it to succeed. But we're one of several ingredients in that. And so you, you really want to be able to work with the startup and the other co-investors as we bring it to bear. Wonderful. In mobility, we have had a great success in building the ecosystem in Stuttgart, then Tokyo, then uh, Japan. Uh, then uh, Beijing and now with Fiat, Chrysler and number of tier one, tier two suppliers in Detroit. Coming to Houston, we feel uh, it has an unbelievable potential to both in energy sector, health sector, quite frankly, in transportation and supply chain is the largest export port in America. What do you do as Chevron and personally to enrich the ecosystem in Houston? And more importantly, what we can do together? Because I have been more successful in Paris, Frankfurt, Stuttgart, Tokyo, than I have been in Houston. So I need help. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, moved, 
I moved to Houston in June of 2013. And it was my second rodeo, as they say, because I had lived here in the late 90s. And I came to run this organization, and I've told this story before, but I, um, I started looking at our portfolio, and I realized we had more portfolio companies from Stavanger, Norway, than we did from Houston, Texas. And so I thought, well, why am I here then? And, you know, I guess I, that started my journey of trying to understand Houston and understand what's working and what's not. And, um, you know, so there's some really good things about Houston. Some very large industry sectors, you talked about them, um, and you probably didn't include commercial space, but I think, you know, that's, that's another piece in there that's, you know, really, I, I think, an interesting play. But it's also a large and growing city, so, um, you know, we, so there's, there's always going to be diversity beyond those large sectors. But with large sectors with big technical challenging problems, and, um, you know, the spend potential of those large industries. So I think that is a real selling point. Um, you know, very diverse, um, um, you know, and also an, an ethos in, in Houston of, um, you know, just go do it kind of thing. So very, um, very entrepreneurial, even if it wasn't tech entrepreneurial. Um, also has all of those industry verticals are undergoing some sort of disruption. So that's both um, brought on by innovation, but also can be helped by innovation. So all of those are really positive. Um, I think what, um, I can't speak for life science, but um, I think what our industry has, um, it, it has been very risk um, averse in the past. And similar to why I said Chevron um, established a, a corporate venture group, tended to think, uh, look internally for the solutions or in its established suppliers. And the, so the hurdle to get into these companies and get your products into use was hard. Um, I think that's changing, I think for the good. Um, and it's changing because um, a lot of the innovation that is going to solve some of the problems in, in the energy system is digitization, it's software, it's, um, you know, there's, there's diversity in the energy industry in terms of fuel source, there's um, expectations around decarbonization. So lots of things where the innovation is likely not to come from the incumbent players. And so, Figuring, so there's an appetite to look outside, there's an appetite for change, and um, now we need to put the building blocks together to be able to, to marry up the small and the big, or is the big, the big buildings and the small buildings. Um, I think the, 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 the piece of it that I would entice you to relative to Houston is an ecosystem takes all players. And so, you know, we have you know, one, we have a mayor that's the biggest champion of, of, of cities you can have, right? And he, he understands the absolute great things about the past, but he's looking forward to the future. He, he sees the opportunity to build this part of the economy in Houston. He knows it's going to take all, part, all kinds coming together. And we've got various um, community groups. Houston Exponential is one of them where convening the universities, the corporates, the startups, the investors, you know, the city, all together to rally around Houston. So we may compete against each other in the business and everything, but we're all in it for Houston. So, you know, I would say give us a shot um, that I think, um, you know, Houston, Houston doesn't lose much. So I think Houston's going to win on this one. Um, and it's not going to look like Silicon Valley. It's not going to look like Boston. It's going like, to look like Houston. It's, it's got to take the unique attributes of what we've got here and, and progress forward. You know, we, <laughs> we open and open. It's been a little challenge during this COVID to build the team and build the process. But we like to commit to doing 20 investments. In Houston, in the energy sector, in transportation sector, in the health sector, 
And Sylvester Turner, as you said, is a great supporter. And if anything good, I'd like to now talk to you a little bit about COVID-19. Sure. Anything good came out of this for plug and play. I realize we can do things uh, like I have over 250 people in Silicon Valley competing with Apple and Google is not what I like to do for talent. And you know, you buy a fixer upper for $2 million, <laughs> 2,000 square feet. And I, what do you think? Do you think, like, I know Toyota moved their headquarters to Texas. When I visited them, they were incredibly happy with the talent that was willing to move to Texas and the talent they could find there. Do you feel? more people would love to do technology jobs in Texas, specifically in Houston, and could something good or great come out of this remote working and not next to the headquarter? I believe even Apple is planning to expand greatly in Texas. Yeah. <clears throat> So, so you've got a couple of things there, um, but but the sil one of the silver linings of COVID is is what we're doing right now, right? Which is learning to use technology to imagine that we're both in the same room, and we're not, right? I'm not even sure where you are, but um, um, and and I think that will have implications on how we collectively work. And, you know, I'm a three coaster. I was, I, you know, I'm from the East Coast. I lived in the West Coast. Now I'm in the Gulf Coast. And people want to live where they want to live, right? And um, I do think that um, having this artificial boundary that you have to, you have to be physically where your, where your employer is, I think, I think some of that's going to start to change. One of the things we've seen in the last, say, month here in Houston is that, um, and, it, and it really was catalyzed by this um, venture capital fund of funds that we initiated here in Houston, was we have had more venture capitalists come and knock on the door, you know, figuratively, in Houston to say, what you got? Let, let us look at them. And they don't have to fly here. Right, and, and so we're doing it virtually. And so I think we're taking this, you know, really serious pandemic and turning it on its head to say, you know, come visit, visit with quotes and get to know what we're doing. And, you know, our startups here, obviously um, they wanna be here, um, but they also want access to some of the things that you can get on the West Coast or the East Coast. and so. I personally think we're going to see some positives for, um, you know, for all parts of the ecosystem uh, with better able, you know, better using the, this technology. We certainly have seen it within Chevron, um, but I think broader speaking in, in the ecosystem, we're seeing that, um, that advantage. And then how do you the infrastructure, the buildings, the, I know that Exxon, Mobile just built an incredible headquarter with the cube on top. Do you feel this remote working will change Chevron uh, HR department and less people in big buildings or on campuses? If, if you could use the last three months experience, what does your crystal ball tell you? It's supposed to well, be innovation yeah. business. You know, so, so first of all, I do want to acknowledge we have something like 28,000 people that actually do go to the, to the operations every day because they can't do their work remotely. And so I'm very thankful for, for them. Um, they go to platforms, refineries, construction sites, uh, service stations and stuff. So they are truly providing the energy that the world needs today. Um, but there's a whole bunch of us that are working from home. And um, 
you know, we made it work from a technology perspective and it has really impacted everyone in, in their own unique way, right? And, um, you know, we have people who, you know, love it. Um, we have people that are managing, uh, you know, family and schooling while they're working and, and you know, they're really blazing new trails. Um, we as a company set up, you know, a very rigorous framework about, you know, so how would we reopen when we do? And, you know, we, 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 we shut down really quickly, but how would we reopen? And we realized that it, the decisions had to be made locally because our, our buildings are different, um, our population, size of our populations are different, and the, the COVID levels in our various geographies around the world are different and the government regulations are different. So Houston is one of the most challenging. Um, we have something like 7,400 people here. Um, we are a downtown company, so we do not have the suburban office that ExxonMobil has. Um, but we have we have these vertical things. You know, we have a 50-story and a 40-story, and so you know we have these bottlenecks called elevators. And um, you know, right now we have very few people working in them, and we've put together a framework with you know what we have to do to get to the next stage for opening up. But I think what's happened is we have demonstrated to ourselves, to our employees, um, that flexibility is the key right now because everybody's situation is different. Um, we, we don't know when we're gonna come back. We don't know how we're gonna come back. We don't know what will be different. Right now we're trying to work with everybody in terms of how they work. But I will say flexibility will be an integral part of the go forward. So if I had to do my crystal ball the notion that everybody has to come to come to the office five days a week or four days a week if you don't work on Fridays, I think that's for the history books. Uh, personally, you know, I, I really miss my employees. I miss the community space and I miss being able to walk down the hall and see five or 10 people and there's an efficiency in that, but there's also a social nature. But I also know I'm pretty good at working from home on, on things. And so, you know, I think what people are going to probably want is a balance of that. Um, and we're going to feel our way through that as a company. Wonderful. Before I turn it to the audience to ask questions, I have to ask you a personal question. You know, I know that you're a fan of marathon and symphony. And when do you think... Uh, we could go to a symphony again, and uh, what effect has it had this crazy times for you personally? Yeah, so so I am I'm I am a runner, and and I'm on the symphony board. So um, I am very proud of our symphony um, and the orchestra and the and the management. Um, they are putting together plans for just what you said which is how do you get back into the hall? And they're gonna start by, um, we'll start, it, it will be performances where there'll be musicians on stage. And by the way, you've gotta make sure they're safe. So there's social distancing. So the number of musicians has to be less, but they will perform, but there will be no audience live. And so it'll be live streaming. And they are working through in a very detailed plan, collaborating with the hospitals here at the medical center, collaborating with the city, and really thinking about how can you reintroduce the experience of the hall, which we all miss, but do it responsibly. And so I am very proud of the, the work that they're doing. Um, it's not easy. It's it's very detailed planning. It's almost like putting a person in space. You know how much detailed planning, but I think they'll figure it out. Um, and they've shown some a lot of flexibility in the interim. They've done a lot of live streaming, but we all know that it's the actual experience that you know it's that real live experience in the hall is what really we live for. So um, I'm betting on them that they're going to get it and they're gonna do it right, but it's been really fun to be a part of it. Thanks for asking about that. And when you come to Houston, I, and if they're back in the hall, I'll take you there. I appreciate it. I wanna tell you right now, we are in the middle of our 
summer summit, we have our IoT mobility, energy and real estate. And in the next two days, we have our FinTech, InsureTech, Health. And I want to tell you a funny story. Occasionally, when we have this uh, meeting, a lot of people fly in. Over a three-day summit, we have close to 2,000 visitors. And 1,000 of them fly in. And I, sometimes I have a backyard party. And I occasionally forget to tell my wife till a week before the party. And <laughs> then she tells me, Saeed, how many guests are you expecting? I think, like, I think about three, four hundred. But I am going to miss those gatherings till we can uh, socialize again together. You know, we are trying our best. In fact, after this energy expo, we have a little a social gathering on Zoom, but it's never the same. And uh, as I think we discussed, it's hard to build new relationships, but to maintain the old relationship and to uh, like invest in startups or help startups uh, succeed, you can almost do it more efficiently. Do you have any experience recently that you were engaged with your team and your one of your portfolio companies that you could share with us? How did that experience work and was it easier, harder? Yeah, I mean, you bring up a good point, Saeed. We have engaged all of our portfolio companies because they're going through the same assessment First, make sure their employees are safe, assessment, self-help, all, all of those things that, you know, Chevron's going through the same thing at a different scale, but our portfolio companies are doing that as well. So um, I think with the existing companies, we, um, you know, that works fine and the technology works fine. And in fact, more people seem to be able to participate because you don't all have to physically be there. Uh, we've, we've closed on a couple of investments during this time. But what we haven't done is taken a company from beginning of due diligence all the way to the end, because part of our um, part of our process is we go and visit them. We make sure that you know we we go and look at their operations, depending on what they do. We go and look at we go and talk to their organization. So we haven't done all of that part, and so I think that's something that we're going to have to figure out how to do. And the other piece that you mentioned, which I'm still trying to figure out is, how do you, I mean, I'm a very extroverted person. In any given month, I meet a lot of new people and I've met less people in the last two months. And, you know, we do it by introductions and everything, but it's, it's a little less, well, it's, it's more difficult than it was. And so I think we're all trying to figure out how to do that. I love the serendipity of going to an event. I, you know, I would have gone to your backyard. I'd probably give your wife a little more notice than you would. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm very comfortable going and at the beginning not knowing very many people and at the end knowing a lot more. That's, that. you know, I thrive in that. And we haven't really figured out how to do that as, a, as an organization, as a society and stuff. So if you have any good um, um, practices in that, I would be very interested in knowing. Wonderful. <laughs> Are trying different technologies in you know smaller groups of six people in fact I'm gonna host one of the tables and uh, you know we you know like I remember I invested in a company called Hive 7 that was a virtual world like Second Life and I really think we could bring that virtual gaming technology to uh, experience going to an event, but it's just the beginning of it. In you know, in uh, connected health, from uh, five percent of the visits of the doctor, it went up to seventy percent. Wow! In three months. And you could imagine uh, 
there is going to be new technology developed for visiting your doctor. And I know that we work with Lloyd's Register for safety. Now they are doing inspection of the ships and inspection of the material inside the ship or at the oil rig remotely. And that is like needs a lot of technology for them to be able to verify it. I, I honestly think there will be a lot of new ideas, new innovation, new opportunities will come from this challenge that we are going through. But with that, Barbara, I wanted to invite back Payal to see mm -hmm. there is some interesting question, but I'm very grateful for oh. your time. Sure. So Payal, bring them on. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Saeed. And yes, I remember going to uh, your backyard for that dinner. I didn't realize you only gave your wife a week's notice on that. That was quite a large party. <laughs> Um, but we've got some great questions coming in for you, Barbara. So first one, mm -hmm. um, uh, in 2017, Chevron launched the Catalyst program. Could you share some more information about that program and what success is? Sure. Yeah, so, so Catalyst was a, is a program for pre-Series A, um, so very early stage. And it's a milestone-based grant program, so it's not um, so it's not an investment, um, but it allows us to learn more about a company, not only about the technology, but about how the management team works, and can they deliver on what they say they you know are going to lay out. And um, it you know so we've had I, I don't remember the exact number, but we uh, we've had several companies go through it, and. A, a couple of the companies, you know, halfway through their milestones, we, wow, we said, well, we really want to invest in these folks. And usually the last milestone is a signed term sheet for Series A. Um, but we've actually accelerated that um, with a few. Uh, some of them have delivered on time and then we've invested. And there have been a few that either pivoted away from what we originally saw as very attractive or we learned that you know they really wouldn't be a company for us to invest in for a variety of different reasons. So um, you know it's supposed to be, and I think it, I, I think it delivers on this promise is you know it's a it's a quicker way to have kind of a you know trial relationship, if you will. But f for us, but from the startup, it also that's you know there's certain certain times in the development of a company that are that are difficult. From a financial standpoint, from a scaling, from you know, and and the types of companies or investors that would be interested in, and we knew that right before Series A was was a difficult time, and they can accelerate their Series A maybe too much to try to try to get funding, and they're not really ready for it from from their technology roadmap. So it's it, it's. It's been a good tool. Um, I would credit, um, you know, Kamal and Barchi, Stuart Coleman, others for, um, you know, developing it and being true to what we wanted to do with it and, and stewarding these companies through that period, many into being full-fledged portfolio companies. Yeah, that's a great story. So several of the companies that are at least one of our in our fall cohort last fall in Houston, uh, what was a member of the Catalyst program, Ingo. So um, I think there's definitely room for plug and play to help um, with your Catalyst program. Mm -hmm. um, next question, um, what are your main themes for your current investments? So we have, um, we have two active funds for new investments right now from a direct company investment. You know, one is, core oil and gas and digital. And, you know, I would say, you know, it, the, the digital is in optimization, um, um, you know, in our operations and things like that. Um, and that cuts across the whole company. On the future, so then there's the future energy fund. And I mentioned this was around, 
lowering the emissions of oil and gas, but also low carbon value chains. And we've looked at three pillars in this one. One is just, you know, macro decarbonization. So different, different energy sources than hydrocarbons, um, storage. Then there's one around mobility. So we talked about the importance of mobility in our industry and how, to be honest, mobility and energy are really linked together. And the third is this decentralization. So it really looks like um, the changes that are underway in the power value chain. Now, each one of those, um, you know, there's not, there's overlap between them a bit and you could argue with, with an investment could be one side or the other, but they've helped us think through the types of investments we will do and how they intersect with where Chevron's thinking the energy system is going to go. Um, I is, is, you know, we put these categories together in these boundaries and my employees are constantly making them bigger. So um, we have a really wide remit, I would say. <laughs> Um, so the second question is for both Saeed and Barbara, um, and this uh, audience member wanted to know how Chevron and Plug and Play are evaluating companies that are pivoting to ride COVID-19, but are also positioned to re-pivot back to normalcy. Which of those aspects, in your opinion, should stay and what is likely to go beyond um, these working from home conditions? You know, if I could jump on this, uh, you know, Sequoia, one of our favored VCs, uh, like almost act so quickly and uh, made a, and always leaks. They gave a notice to all their portfolio companies that you should conserve cash, you should uh, be more cautious. It's going to take longer to deploy your technology and I believe in that saying that though we are investing like in the last 30 days we did uh, close to 10 new investment we have had some of our portfolio companies uh, like raise 100 million dollar from TPG is a security company for background checks and now when you have everybody deliver stuff to your home like five times a day knowing the identity of that driver is a key and uh, so i believe good companies are built during tough time and now good companies will get funded and grow uh, no matter what. Uh, so, but we do like we have uh, a few companies that pivoted and use their technology to do tr tr tracking and tracing. The company was doing marketing in the airports that I, I walked in front of uh, a shop. It would say, Saeed, please come in for a glass of champagne on my mobile they knew who i was where i was so now that company pivoted and says i can track everybody at the airport for safety so but but i feel it's not either or i think they could do both technologies uh, and use the same infrastructure but i love to know what barbara feels yeah, so, so I think it's a good question, and it's got a, a few layers to it. One is just taking this opportunity and, and looking at the way that um, technology use has been accelerated and really riding that. So we invested in a company a few years ago, and they never had a corporate office. They were virtual from day one, and their, and their thought process was hire people and let them live where they want to live and we'll get better talent that way. So this was a no-brainer for them. Obviously, they haven't missed a beat, um, but also some of their practices are now things that, that, they were just part of their operating system, but things that um, some of their customers and others are interested in relative to a product. Um, you know, I think others are chasing relative to whether it's PPE or, um, 
vaccines and so forth, they're not really in our industry, but the PPE might be, um, you know, and I think, you know, listen, if they, if they um, have something that can help solve this and it's utilizing the main capabilities that they have, uh, that, that, that seems both opportunistic, but also good for society. So, um, you know, we've supported some of our companies in that they had, they had ways in which they could help with this, the bigger challenge, but using their own capabilities, not just 180 degree pivot and basically walk away from what was their core business. Yeah. Great to hear. And I know we're uh, coming up on time. So last question for you, Barbara, and mm -hmm. I'm going to be selfish and take it for myself. Oh, boy. So um, I guess just on behalf of Saeed and uh, the local plug and play team here in Houston, what can we be doing to help uh, Chevron and the city of Houston? Well, I'll, I'll, those are two different entities. So, you know, I think, so let me, let me talk about Houston in general, you know, because I think it's going to take, it's going to take a lot of different players. And I think, um, you know, being present, um, developing relationships with all the key components of the ecosystem. So knowing where the startups are and the ones that kind of fit your, your set of tools and, and helping them. Um, you've got a Rolodex of co-investors, I am sure. Talk to them about Houston. Um, you've got a Rolodex around corporations. So what are their problems? And what is the challenge of, of the corporation working with the startup? It's not a natural relationship. And so how do they start to work on that? Um, you know, and then, um, you know, the investors here, the universities, you know, I think just building your understanding of those pieces and, and your natural affinity with them. Um, you know, that, that's what I think plug and play could do um, because every city is different. Um, and I think just getting to know kind of the juice here is important. From a, from a Chevron perspective, um, again, some of those are the same, but, um, you know, so it's all about deal flow. It's all about sharing good opportunities. And so if you have opportunities that you think fit within the remit of what we're looking for, share them and vice versa. And similarly with investors, because, you know, it does take a village for each one of these companies. We're not buying the company. We're investing into uh, the plan that they put out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, um, like you, Barbara, I moved here in 2013. So I'm a big fan of Houston. And I look forward to plug and play and my team working with you to do some of those things here locally. So Okay. And I want to thank you and Saeed for the introduction. Hopefully, um, there wasn't too much background noise. I did hear the lawns mowing and I heard some noise upstairs while I was doing this, but you were able to do it. And uh, good luck with your conference. Thank yeah. you so much, Barbara. Thank bye you. Bye. Bye bye. And now I have the pleasure of introducing my colleague, Noreen, from our Energy Ventures team. She will emcee the rest of the program, including the startup pitches. So thank you for joining. Thank you so much, Pyle, for that wonderful introduction, and Barbara and Sergey for being with us here today and chatting about the industry and their take on what's to come. I hope you all learned a lot. I know I did. So without further ado, I would love to invite you all to welcome our 18 energy batch startups for our first ever virtual summer summit. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Noreen, and I work alongside Milad and Alberto on the Ventures team on, alongside our energy colleagues. I will be the MC for the event today, and I hope you all enjoy the event. So to kick us off, we have Copper Labs. Copper Labs is helping utilities take control of their energy demand and engage with their customers using real-time smart meter technology. Hi, this is Dan from Copper Labs. We help utilities take control of energy demand by engaging consumers with real-time meter data. We do this with an easy-to-install device that wirelessly collects revenue-grade data from electric, gas, and water meters. This helps consumers access their energy usage data in real time and creates a channel for utilities to engage the right users when it matters most to the grid. The unique thing about Copper is that we support both drive-by and smart meters on a single platform. 
So for utilities that are doing drive-by meter reading today, copper can bring forward most of the benefits of smart grid in a way that's future-proof because we also have a radio for smart meters. For utilities that have already deployed smart meters, copper helps them engage their consumers in real time in a mobile app to reduce peak loads, accelerate energy efficiency, and generally drive improved customer engagement. Even though we only sell to utilities, we have to make it really easy for consumers to set up our hardware. It gets mailed to the consumer in a small six ounce cardboard box. The consumer simply plugs it into the wall, downloads a mobile app, connects it to their Wi-Fi, snaps a photo of the meter, and we take care of the rest. Once they're set up, consumers can access real-time energy usage data. If they happen to have rooftop solar, they'll see that information as well. From there, Copper will seek to deliver actionable and personalized alerts. For example, an anomaly detection. If someone's using 50% more than their baseline when normalized for weather, we'll go ahead and send that alert. But the biggest value of Copper's app is to support customer engagement during demand management events. Um, and so what you'll be able to see as you get into the app is utilities can call a demand response event, for example, engage targeted users, and then measure that, uh, that not only the engagement, but the curtailment. Additionally, Copper has the only utility voice skill that leverages real-time meter data. So we can work with utilities uh, to answer much more sophisticated questions for consumers that support programs from time of use pricing uh, or whatever might be the objective of a given utility. For utilities, they interact with copper data through APIs or our web app called a utility portal. The utility portal is unique because it surfaces real-time meter loads on a geographic map that enables utilities to sort by load type, load profile, and target specific users. For example, they might spot someone who's charging an electric vehicle during peak hours. They can send a push notification to those individuals and Copper's gonna help the utility to measure consumer engagement both in the app and at the meter in real time using revenue grade curtailment data. As an example of what uh, Copper can do for utilities and related partners, we partnered on a smart city called Sterling Ranch in Colorado with Siemens and XL Energy. Siemens was selected as the systems integrator to deploy everything from sprinkler controllers to video security and they were interested in a cost-effective way to surface real-time energy and water usage data for their consumers. They partnered with Copper to do this. Consumers have access to all those fuel types on an in-home display, and Copper is the source of record for water billing data in that community. XL Energy then engages those consumers using Copper's data services with the specific objective of reducing peak loads on hot summer days through a behavioral demand response program. We started the program in the summer of 2019. It will expand through 2020 and 21, uh, and we'll look forward to sharing more details uh, about the performance of this program and other solutions that Copper has to offer. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for that incredible start to our Summer Summit event. Now, we will hear from Connect City. Connect City is a smart control center to enable the future of the connected smart city. My name is Rayan Arif, CEO and co-founder of Connect City Technology. Our team boasts 150 years of combined experience of software, engineering expertise in manufacturing and industrial automation. Our team is highly qualified in many disciplines we have worked alongside prestigious companies including Kodak, IBM, and Intel. Our first case study is an international carrier losing millions due to manual systems and operational inefficiencies. We created a digital twin and automation of the entire system. Multiple systems like arrivals, departures, flight connections, boarding lists, taxi and runways now respond to a single platform. All assets and resources are embedded with sensors now visualized in 3D, tracked and located using GPS. Operators can instantly locate any ground asset 
view status and deploy in a few seconds. System now allows for real-time collaboration with ground staff. Platform integrated with flight radar, tracking inbound and outbound flights. This triggers automated procedures for allocating tasks and resources. The results? Ground crew reduced by 30%. Operational costs reduced by 25%, budgets and KPIs now directly managed and controlled by smart technology. Our second case study is a smart city initiative. The problem, manual systems, poor customer service, operational inefficiencies and loss of revenue. Our solution, entire fleet of waste collection trucks, road sweepers, trash cans, and buildings fitted with smart sensors, smart cameras, geolocated and tracked in real time. IoT sensors embedded on trucks for level detection. System integrated with traffic control data in real time. Buildings graphically represented, monitored and managed with AI cameras and IoT sensors. Collection trucks, waste bins and road sweepers, KPIs tracked in real time. 6,000 containers, now smart containers with sensor technology. The results, 30% reduction in labor costs, 30% reduction in collection costs, 30% reduction in building management costs, 32% more waste collected per hour, 20% less miles covered, traffic congestion reduced by 50%. Our alliance with Plug and Play is creating exciting opportunities with interest from US, Japan, China and Europe. We signed a strategic partnership agreement with Versar, a global project management company. They carry out large-scale government projects worldwide. DOD and NAFAC are showing keen interest in our technology to build smart 3D military bases. We're seeking projects, pilots and strategic partnerships. Our technology is proven in several verticals. To date, we are self-funded. However, we are open to strategic investments. Thanks guys, and thank you for an incredible presentation. Moving on, we will now hear from AMP Control, AMP Control is an AI-powered optimization software for electric vehicle charging networks to install more charging stations at a lower cost. Hi, Plug and Play, dear partners. I'm Joachim and I'm founder and CEO of AMP Control. AMP Control is a software to optimize the charging of electric vehicles. And before I founded the company, I worked as energy consultant for PwC. And with me on the core team is Bela Patkai, who worked as postdoc for the University of Cambridge and John H. Lund, who brings his great experience from his PhD in smart grids. So we see that the numbers of EVs are really growing fast, and we expect that the market has 40 million EV chargers by 2030. But the problem here is that the electric grid was simply not designed for so many chargers. For instance, the locations are often not even able to provide the power for these chargers. But is it really a problem? Well, we see that companies like charging point operators, car manufacturers and utilities are currently really limited in the growth. And this can actually make the entire transitions to EVs fail. So at Amp Control, we are running AI-based optimizations to optimize uh, the cost and also help companies to grow. Our algorithms are matching, therefore, each charging event to price signals, solar power, and reduce the peak demand on networks. And therefore, it calculates individual charging profile for each single event. And the best thing is, our customers can integrate this by themselves without even needing any additional hardware. Our product is deployed since December 2019, and we work with customers like EDP, leading utility in Europe, helping them to optimize the charging in Lisbon, but also with companies like Arrival, leading EV van manufacturer, selling EVs to companies like UPS. One of our most exciting integrations is with one of European's biggest charging networks. Has to be today operates more than 20,000 charging stations in 15 countries. 
we're here fully integrated in their backend system and are optimizing and on different locations. And the next steps now are to deploy on locations such as airports, company headquarters, and so on. The market is growing fast. With our subscription-based model and self-service approach, basically customers can integrate themselves, the market is growing to $1 billion by 2025. The core multipliers here are really the increasing numbers of EV models on the market, increasing uh, incentives uh, from the state, but also more affordable models and new models for companies and fleets. This is also why we are raising right now. In the last month, we really achieved building the product, getting first customers on board, making our implementations. And now we are expanding in two major areas. First, we are extending our product by integrating the optimizations of stationary batteries that makes EV charging more reliable and faster. Second, we are expanding our technology by integrating our telematic data from vehicles and running projects with car manufacturers. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the plug and play event. Incredible. Thank you, Joachim, for that amazing presentation and for being with us here today. Next up, I would love to introduce you all to Gila Technologies. Gila's IQ platform enables operators to manage fleets of assets to simplify the integration of distributed energy resources and the microgrid. Hello everyone, my name is Francisco Morox, co-founder and CEO of Hela Technologies. At Hela, we are dedicated to simplifying the integration and operation of the distributed energy resources, or DERs, around and within microgrids, through the development of the next generation of the centralized control and optimization technologies. We believe that the ability to cost-effectively integrate clusters of these DERs into low-carbon microgrids will have a significant impact in the industry helping to reduce carbon emissions, as well as energy costs, and strengthening the overall grid's resiliency. There are, however, technical challenges to overcome. The equipment ecosystem is composed of many technologies, vendors, and protocols, making the equipment difficult to integrate with each other. Even if you manage to integrate the assets, having them perform in harmony to achieve the site's operational priorities in the right amount of time can be very challenging. And finally, current solutions are not meant for evolving systems. Once your microgrid is working, site requirements might evolve, and these translate into significant additional costs required to overhaul the control framework. Traditional centralized control approaches are not well suited to address these realities, and they limit how effectively the energy resources perform, making it hard for utilities and operators to manage large and complete fleets of the ERs. Our platform leverages edge computing and game theory to infuse of intelligence each DR. With our approach, each asset gets a HALA controller so that they can make their own decisions on how to best operate to respond to a request from a DERMS or a site operator. Our devices standardize disparate DERS and are agnostic to type, vendor, and protocols. They work together to ensure DERS automatically maintain the stability of the system while responding in a matter of seconds to external operational commands and price signals and they allow the microgrid to grow organically. If your site needs more batteries after the initial deployment, you just add them with some new Hela edges, and they're ready to play along the previously installed equipment. Our solution is quite versatile, and our operational microgrids reflect that, spanning the full spectrum of functionalities and customer types. As examples, project one and two shown here are utility projects, and we're done with American Electric Power and Holy Cross Energy. They focus on aggregating residential DRs to provide grid services from behind and in front of the meter. Project three was deployed at a US military base in Albuquerque. In this project, we partner with Emera Technologies, who actually deployed the DRs. While project four was deployed at a vineyard in Sonoma, California. This microgrid is very advanced and heterogeneous and can help illustrate the value that these type of systems can provide during grid disruptions. Since 2017, the microgrid has been frequently islanded during the wildfires-based outages affecting the region. Just late last year, it was islanded during the PSPS events and has been off the grid for several months. We have a very strong pipeline, and this year we are poised to scale our operations. As an update on our funding, we're currently in the process of closing a $3 million round. 
We have secured $2.1 million from an infrastructure project financing firm and the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center and are in active discussions with several industrial oriented entities to fund the rest. Thank you for having me here today. If you're interested in learning more about our company, technology, or funding, we would love to hear from you. Awesome. Thank you for another incredible presentation. Next, we will hear from GridCure. GridCure provides predictive real-time analytics for electric utilities. Hi there. My name is Tag, and I'm the CEO of GridCure. At GridCure, we're on a mission to bring predictive analytics to electrical power utilities. Here's why that's important. Utilities are facing a series of very difficult problems. Hi there. My name is Tag, and I'm the CEO of GridCure. At GridCure, we're on a mission to bring predictive analytics to electrical power utilities. Here's why that's important. Utilities are facing a series of very difficult problems. Not only do they have old equipment that is failing exponentially faster and in more expensive ways, but they also now have to worry about all the new grid technologies, things like the Nest thermostat on your wall, the Tesla battery pack in your basement, even your electric car itself. These are all load or demand sources the utility needs to monitor and maintain if you want the lights to stay on. Fundamentally, utilities have a huge complexity issue to solve. That's where we come in. We provide utilities with a platform with pre-built, ready-to-go applications that solve exactly these kinds of predictive analytical issues, like identifying which transformer is going to explode next week, or even suggesting where to install new hardware like that next EV charging station. Think of us like the app store for your standard transmission and distribution utility. The reason we can do this so effectively is because we can rely on data the utility has already collected. The smart meter on the side of your house, the better communicating SCADA systems, and generally speaking, telecom communication improvements over the past few years mean that the average utility is generating between 1,000 and 100,000 times as much raw information about their network as compared to just a few years ago. This lets us come to utilities and say, hey, don't install any new sensors, don't install any new servers, just give us the data you've already got to let us solve these problems for you. This is big and, and it's happening in a big market. Our ground up total addressable market estimate with our current pricing gives us about a $1.3 billion market size. And that's only selling a pretty conservative two to four applications to a given client. Speaking of clients, utilities are exactly the right kind of customer we want in this economic environment. Not only have we got some tricks up our sleeve to dramatically shorten the sales cycle with both technical as well as sales process improvements, but our customers are legally not allowed to go out of business, all have AAA credit ratings, and are typically the biggest beneficiaries of stimulus spending when, say, hypothetically, there's a huge market crash. We've got a fantastic team made up of folks from utilities like myself, from startup exits, from the top big data companies around the world, and some of the best CS schools in the game. We've had solid growth over the past few years, and just last week, we sent over the final quote for a new client that's gonna represent about another $1.1 million ARR bump for us. Here's a few case studies. You can pause the video to take a look at in more detail. But in general, most clients we work with get up to a 90% reduction in operating expenses and a 70% improvement in reliability for the equipment the, a particular mon uh, module helps monitor. We'd love to chat further with any investors or companies who are interested in the intersection between big data, literally helping keep the lights on, and the best industry to be in during an economic downturn. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that presentation. Moving on, we will now hear from Terrapin. Terrapin is working with industrial facilities to convert waste heat to power. So please, let's see how they do it. My name is Gray Alton, and I am the Vice President of Project Development for Terrapin Geothermics, and I'm speaking to you from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. I want to thank Plug and Play for this opportunity to showcase Terrapin Geothermics and our solutions to help power the transition towards cleaner, smarter cities. We want to pose this question to you today. How will cities fill their reliable and clean heat and power needs in the future? Our problems are that smart cities are not going to only need clean, but also baseload heat and power, and they, also, they are still trying to figure out how to do it. We also have an extremely large resource that is currently wasted, and these valuable waste heat resources have been underdeveloped and need to be unlocked. 
Terrapin has been working diligently since 2016 to provide smart solutions for the questions I just posed. Terrapin's three waste heat verticals break down to geothermal, a renewable, clean, baseload source of power and direct heat use, waste heat to power, a baseload, emission-free conversion of waste heat to power, and direct heat use, which is a baseload heat source and the most economical use of waste heat. And all terrapin, terrapin verticals generate carbon offsets, which do have market value. And I would love to go into more detail on each vertical if I had more time, so please reach out if there is interest to learn more. But the last point I want to make here is, Terrapin can offer a zero capex option where we pay you for access to develop the waste heat inside your facilities. And do, again, please do reach out if you have interest. Terrapin's goal is to not only unlock this previously wasted resource, we also want to be the linchpin that creates value from it for all players. We do this by partnering with industrial facility owners around the globe to pay them for access to their waste heat resources. Once the most economic waste heat resources have been identified, Terrapin then brings the right technology to the table to best utilize the waste heat resources. Once Terrapin has the waste heat resource owner and, and technology partner aligned, we bring the third party capital and EPC construction partner to the table to round out the development team that will play a part in achieving the circular economy and carbon reduction goals set by our smart cities. So now I wanna talk about Terrapin's track record. Our tier one project in development is a geothermal project called Number One Geothermal, which is being constructed in Northern Alberta. Terrapin secured $25.4 million from the federal Canadian government in non-dilutive federal funding, and we are currently raising into the project for our test well drilling phase. So if you wish to know more, again, please reach out. We cannot announce our tier one projects near sign off just yet, but we are excited to be working with some amazing forward thinking clients, and we hope to have something to announce here soon. Tier 2 represents our next immediate pipeline of projects. Tier 2 is comprised of geothermal and industrial direct heat use developments, along with a second phase of waste heat to power developments. Feasible market growth and future market potential represent our two to five to 10 year plans as a business, and we believe a big future runway exists here for Terrapin. I also want to highlight the flexible waste heat technologies we work with. Heat exchangers and piping are two things we know super well, and Terrapin develops our waste heat to power projects using a heat source agnostic organic rank and cycle technology, which can be deployed across a variety of industries, across a variety of waste heat resources. And we have secured an exclusive agreement with a world-class ORC designer and manufacturer named Exergy, who have almost 1000 megawatts of ORC power facilities in operation around the globe over the last 10 years. We've been backed by the support of many prominent industry associations and programs that you can see here. We are also backed by our specialized and industry tested team that we have compiled to help solve our clients waste heat to power, direct heat use, or geothermal development needs. And of course, you can't end a pitch without an ask. Terrapin is actively in search of clients who want to sell their waste heat to us, or clients who need Terrapin to come audit and assess your waste heat potential. And of course, we're always on the lookout for great industry mentors, advisors, and friends. Thank you so much for allowing me to present Terrapin and please reach out if there's interest. Cheers. Awesome. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Next up, I would love to introduce you all to Anaptor. Anaptor is working on a highly efficient hydrogen generator to replace fossil fuels. So Anaptor, take us away. I'm very happy to have the opportunity today to talk to you a little bit about the IM electrolyzer and Anaptor. My name is Thomas, Thomas Krometzka, and I'm the head of strategy at Enaptor. We have uh, set up Enaptor, an award-winning company, as you can see, to do a few things differently in the hydrogen sector, but I'll be coming back to that topic in a second. Um, we're talking hydrogen here today uh, because we believe that the hydrogen is the missing link in the energy transition, and when we talk about hydrogen, we absolutely mean green hydrogen. Um, electrolyzers, our product, are a way to turn sunshine and water into uh, a green fuel, a green gas that can be used in any kind of application, be it in synthetic fuels, uh, in electricity storage, or in many direct use cases in the industry um, for heating. And absolutely what we need when we are thinking about how to decarbonize our future. Our electrolyzer is different from what you see in the market because it is designed as a product. Um, you can see here that 
It is a form factor that can easily be fitted into a 19-inch rack. It has a very low production rate with 500 norm liters per hour and a power consumption of 2.2 kilowatts. But what you will immediately understand is that this device can be stacked to infinite sizes. So you can combine as many of these modules to achieve the flow rate that you're needed. And here it is mirroring the principle, for example, the solar panel, uh, which is exactly similarly set up as a small and modular device that you can combine into any kind of size. We're different because the rest of the industry is building large systems. And the analogy here is the mainframe and the, PV, uh, the PC uh, that disrupted the computer industry in the 80s. And uh, we hope that we have a place in the market with the offering that we can bring to our customers. We're not only focusing on hardware, we are also very much exposed to software. We believe that energy companies of the future do need to have a hardware and a software offering. And this is why we're developing a very unique energy management system that is low cost and allows the residential energy storage solution to benefit from a good energy management system as well as the industrial solution that customers might be looking for. We have use cases already in 33 countries in the world and almost, I think it is more than 100 customers today. Um, you can see on this one a typical seasonal storage uh, use case where hydrogen is used to produce power in winter times. But our electrolyzers are used in very innovative uh, use cases. Here it is a power to heat use case where district heating is provided by the hydrogen that we produce. We use our hydrogen refueling stations for drone, for aircrafts, for cars, for many different applications. We have a bunch of industrial customers who are using hydrogen in float glass manufacturing, nitrogen purification, as you can see here but also in ammonia production and other cases. Power to gas, an important one as well. And our goal is ultimately to drive the cost for hydrogen down to a price of 150 euros or less per kilogram in terms of capex. This requires massive scaling efforts, which is why we're investing a lot into automated production line and uh, ultimately make this green hydrogen reality happen. Thank you very much for your attention. Excellent. Thank you so much, guys, for being with us here today and for another incredible presentation. We will now hear from Blue Planet Energy. Blue Planet Energy is using their Blue Planet Ion storage platform to drive the increased use of, oh my God. Awesome. Thank you so much for that overview. Next up, we have Blue Planet Energy. Blue Planet Energy is enabling grid independence with their scalable Blue Ion Energy platform to drive the increased use of renewable power generation. Aloha, I'm Christopher Johnson, and I'm grateful to Plug and Play for the opportunity to connect with you virtually today. 20 years ago, I got my start in renewable energy, and today I'm delighted to introduce you to our climate tech startup, Blue Planet Energy. We make the premium battery-based microgrid solutions for homes, businesses, and critical infrastructure. Blue Planet Energy was founded in 2015 in Hawaii. We've grown rapidly and have deployed over 23 megawatt hours of our products. Our staff are distributed and we have operations in Hawaii, California, Illinois, and Puerto Rico. We are a mission-driven company seeking a world where all electricity is generated through safe, resilient local resources. Our scalable energy platform, Blue Ion, delivers safe, reliable, clean energy through distributed battery-based microgrids. We are seeking values-aligned partners for growth equity or project financing, as well as partnerships for customer acquisition. We have an amazing leadership team with extensive roots in renewable energy and startups. Our visionary founder, Hank Rogers, is a notable clean energy pioneer whose innovation spanned 15 years and led him to found Blue Planet Energy to commercialize the best solutions for the climate crisis. The climate crisis creates two massive hurdles for society. First, we must decarbonize our energy systems with additional renewable energy. However, the electricity grid was not designed for this and renewable production is variable. The second major challenge we face is the need to adapt to increasing severity of storms and natural disasters. Modern life is energy dependent and we need energy security. 
Luckily, there's a solution for both of these challenges in microgrids using safe energy storage. I emphasize safety because there are dangerous trends ignoring safety in the industry. Electric vehicle battery manufacturing dominates energy storage and has led to severe safety issues. The nickel and cobalt and EV batteries add density but make the batteries susceptible to thermal runaway. South Korea, which is a few years ahead of other leading markets in adoption, experienced 21 battery fires over 2018 and 2019 that caused tens of millions of dollars of damage and led to the shutdown of over 600 energy storage sites. For most, these challenges to adoption mean energy storage is too hard. For us, this is the opportunity we solve for. Across the product life cycle, there are many pitfalls holding back adoption from safety risk to disjointed components and sketchy vendors and challenges in operating the system safely. We solve for these challenges with a true solutions approach. Our blue ion systems are the premium solution for ruggedized, reliable performance. Our current offering of grid optional products serves residential, commercial, and critical infrastructure customers, whether or not the electric grid is present. With intelligent software controls, we can integrate a wide variety of energy sources, whether you are using solar, the grid, or a generator, or any combination. Over the last two years, we have demonstrated strong market traction with 300% annual revenue growth and reaching the milestone of profitability in 2019. And even in the current market conditions, as an essential business supporting critical infrastructure, we are seeing significant orders and great opportunities for growth in the years ahead. We have channel partners that include over 150 in certified installers covering all states in the U.S. and expanding internationally. And increasingly, we are engaging strategic partners who have large-scale needs for our solutions. For example, the American Red Cross, who is active in rebuilding Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. We supplied what is now the largest energy resilience project in the US, which includes nearly six megawatts of solar and 11 megawatt hours of our blue ion energy storage distributed across 125 microgrids located at emergency shelters on the island. We are seeking strategic partners that have needs for battery-based microgrids across a fleet of projects. Anywhere where the cost of energy is high or the cost of disruption to operations from a grid outage is severe are good places for our solutions. In examples include energy real estate managers or REITs, critical infrastructure, or remote operations such as mining and extraction. Whether you are interested to be a financial partner or have a need for our solutions in your business, I hope this introduction has piqued your interest. I look forward to connecting with those called to be a part of this clean energy revolution. Mahalo. Great. Thank you so much, guys, for an awesome presentation. Next, we have RevTerra. RevTerra is working on a flywheel energy storage system for long-duration utility-scale applications. So please, let's hear from RevTerra. Renewable energy sources are not only an important route to reducing carbon emissions, but they are increasingly becoming competitive or even cheaper than fossil fuel power sources, such as coal. Because of their nature, renewable energy sources do not produce constant power. For large-scale deployments of renewables to be feasible, energy storage is required to moderate their output. Whether it is harmful mining practices, hazardous battery fires, environmental impacts, high cost or low efficiency, currently available energy storage technologies suffer from serious obstacles to large-scale implementation. Flywheel energy storage, in which kinetic energy is stored by spinning up a steel disk to high speeds, is a known technology that is non-toxic, 60 to 75% cheaper than lithium ion batteries, and scalable, but has been limited to niche applications because of inefficiencies. Revterra is developing a highly efficient flywheel energy storage system based on our passive magnetic bearing technology, which enables new long duration applications such as the storage of renewables. The bearings in currently available flywheel energy storage systems drain energy through friction or by power hungry control systems. On the left of this slide is a comparison between flywheel energy storage systems with mechanical bearings, active magnetic bearings, and Revterra's passive magnetic bearings, based on data from our prototype system. Because our passive magnetic bearings do not require a complex control system or high power input, energy losses are cut by 20 times. Our technology matches the long discharge duration of chemical batteries, 
while retaining the longevity and low cost of flywheels. A key to utility scale energy storage, our initial target market. Utility scale energy storage is a fast growing market expected to reach $7.1 billion by 2025 in the US alone. The pace of new renewable energy installations is growing every year with 20 gigawatts installed just last year. Our planned MVP system will be a 100 kilowatt hour modular base unit, which can be put together in series to meet the energy storage demand of a customer. Based on a bottom up cost estimation, we think that initially we can sell each unit for $27,500 or $275 per kilowatt hour. Based only on the projected new solar developments in the US in the next five years, there would be demand for up to 500,000 units which we believe will present a great market opportunity for us. Our main competition is another flywheel energy storage developer based in California called Amber Kinetics. They have a smaller 32 kilowatt hour product commercially available and have been planning a 160 kilowatt hour utility scale product for some time, which they aim to sell for $325 per kilowatt hour. However, their system is substantially less efficient than ours, and their technology doesn't scale well up to the larger sizes needed to drive, to drive down costs, whereas ours inherently does. We have two issued patents protecting our technology, raised some angel money last year, and have built a prototype system. And we've recently received an NSF phase one STTR grant. We will be opening up our next fundraising round of $1.5 million soon to fund the development of a scaled up alpha version of our MVP system, which will be used for pilot testing. We have a great team and advisors, including experts in passive levitation flywheels and partners with the NSF and the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Thanks for your attention and I look forward to chatting with you later. Thank you so much for that presentation. Next up, we have Electrify. Electrify is working to develop and supply advanced battery management and inverter solutions to increase battery life and reduce energy storage costs for the household and industry. So please, tell us more about Electrify. Hi, my name is Valentin, and I'm a co-founder and the CEO at Electrify. Our mission is making energy storage affordable. Renewable and reliable power benefits significantly from stationary battery storage in homes, industry, and the power grid. However, standard lithium-ion batteries today remain quite expensive and short-lived. Relectrify focuses on two problems to address this. The first problem is related to lifetime. Large battery packs contain up to 200 individual series connected cells, and the weakest cell limits the entire pack. When batteries are brand new, the cells all perform strongly, and therefore none limit the pack. But as battery packs are used, the cells age unevenly, and the lifetime of the pack is limited by the single weakest series cell. The second problem is related to cost. Connecting to homes, industry, and the grid requires an AC output. Since normal battery packs provide a DC output, an expensive inverter is required. We have solved both these problems. Electrify's mixed software and hardware solution merges the traditional battery management and inverter into one stronger performing, lower cost solution. Every cell is controlled individually, which overcomes the weakest link issue. This increases battery life by up to 30%. Alongside, the cell level control provides a partial AC output, which allows inverter complexity to be vastly reduced. Instead of 20,000 times per second, it only needs to switch about 100 times per second and largely avoids the need for filtering capacitors or inductors. Our approach results in around 30% less battery management and inverter component cost which spread across the full battery system leads to about a 10% cost reduction. Our technology also provides fault redundancy and includes sensors collecting battery performance data, which we then use to further improve our algorithms to make the batteries last even longer. Now, taking a step back, this technology opens up two opportunities. The first is allowing new batteries to be cheaper and have a notably longer life. 
The second is reusing so-called second life batteries, used batteries from electric cars, for a uniquely low capex storage solution. Relectrify was founded in 2015 out of battery research at the University of Melbourne, Australia. Since then, we have scaled our technology across residential and large industrial solutions. These have already found use with Volkswagen Germany, Nissan subsidiary 4R Energy in Japan, and power utility Vector in New Zealand. This January, Relectrify launched our inverter replacing solutions, which are already installed in a project with US power utility AEP and Nissan US in Ohio. Consisting of modular 70 kilowatt hour blocks, these solutions suit installs up to multi megawatt hours. Since joining Plug and Play, Relectrify has progressed very swiftly. We recently signed off on our largest storage project yet, and our planned project pipeline is rapidly growing. We are also receiving key interest on opportunities, including supply of our electronic solutions and supply of full storage products. Relectrify is actively looking for strategic collaborators globally that either manufacture or install stationary battery packs at significant volume. We would love to connect with any relevant companies to see if Electrify can help make your battery packs cheaper and longer lasting. Alongside, while Electrify is currently well capitalized and not raising, if there are investors with interest in a future Series B round, it would be good to connect also. Thank you for your interest and we look forward to discussing further together. Awesome, thank you so much for that incredible presentation. Also, for everyone tuning in online, please feel free to engage with us further using the hashtag PNP Summer Summit 2020 to tweet us online. We'd love to hear your thoughts and engage with you further. But first, let's hear from Preddy. Preddy, pro Preddy processes equipment repair and maintenance data to power predictive maintenance and design for your equipment. Without further ado, let's hear from Preddy. Hello, my name is Doyle Irvin. Um, I'm hoping that this uh, video is going to come through clear. Um, and I also hope that you and your team and your families are doing well and staying healthy um, in these times. So who are we? Um, when it comes to data, service teams are behind and we're here to address that problem. The reason they're behind is that our customers, these service teams, their, their data is very complex and it's very difficult to use. We exist to make the servicing data usable and transformational for your enterprise. That's why we're here. What kind of data are we talking about? Well, it's this data that's not mineable and it, it comes from all these different silos. You have your field visits, your warranty claims, maybe you have an online knowledge base or you're pulling sensor data from your equipment or you have parts ordering data or product manuals and building the value from all these different silos is incredibly difficult. And what's more important is you also have this tribal knowledge in the heads of your employees. That is very difficult to leverage across the entire enterprise. So an example of how this kind of data might, is used today, um, the, on the left, you're going to start with raw data, noisy, unstructured text records, for example, repair orders. And it gets handed to teams of analysts or specialists who process it, who annotate it, who figure it out, categorize it in one way, um, and it gets loaded then into your database or your ERP or your BI tools and integrated into some sort of data-driven product or workflow. And this is a very difficult process here. It's not efficient. So we exist to automate this learning, the discovery, and the extraction of insights. Let me move my face here so you can see that a little bit on the top right. Um, and we start with your noisy data that's not ready or it's too difficult um, for digital products or workflows. Um, it goes through our platform um, and it comes out usable and ready for you to be the smart enterprise and democratize the knowledge of your employees across the enterprise. So what is this? Uh, we're a solution provider um, and it's a combination of our pre-built models in our processing engine and uh, rapid customization for your data and your use. Um, 
Now, our technology is enterprise grade. Every month, we process 2 billion plus repair orders uh, and roughly 100 billion IoT snapshots. Uh, so it's scalable to any size of data that you have. And importantly here, it's relied upon by OEMs and service providers and compliance heavy industries because the insights we provide, the, the minimum threshold is 90 plus percent accuracy. And then the competitive edge here is that it's adaptable to new domains and new product ecosystems because of our automatic ontology discovery, which rapidly understands your product and the way the data is represented in your product ecosystem. Um, these are various solutions we have provided our customers, our customers as you can see along the bottom. <coughs> and uh, I'll go through one example here. Um, you, know, you can reach out or ask for more details on the rest, but in guided repair in the servicing department, because we touch dispatching and sales and engineering as well, but in guided repair, we're leveraging the historical service data to guide technicians through future service events. And what that looks like is our customer was processing repair orders with a team of technicians, a team of technician analysts, to identify the complaint, the cause, and the correction that was present in that repair order, and then load that information into their database, which then gets licensed as a guidance product um, and that you can see along the bottom, a, a handheld scanner that is plugged into you know, the OBD2 uh, port of a car. Um, and we were able to you know, more than 100x this process and make it way more efficient and process the entire data set instead of roughly 50,000 a year. Now, how does this work? Step one, we configure our you know, purpose-built AI platform to your data. Uh, we learn in step two using our automatic ontology discovery tools, you know, what are the insights that matter. In step three, we process your whole data set. And in step four, you consume it um, using an API or one of our dashboards. So why customers choose us? Um, most importantly, we're reducing the costs and startup requirements of AI integration into your products and workflows. And the other most important part here is that we have the servicing experience. We understand equipment. We understand the data that comes from it. This is a, a, a quick, you know, high-level overview of our engagement model. Please feel free to reach out at infoapredi.com if you have any questions. Thank you. Hope to speak to you soon. Awesome. Thank you so much, Freddie, for that incredible presentation. Next up, we have Gecko Robotics. Gecko Robotics is working on robotic inspection solutions to protect and maintain critical industrial assets. So please, let's hear it from Gecko. Hello, my name is Ivan Pistsov. I lead international business development at Gecko Robotics. We use robots to digitize physical infrastructure of the civilization's most critical assets and help asset owners fully understand the state of their equipment. Our goal is to automate the job of industrial engineers who maintain the integrity and non-stop operations of power plants, chemical plants, oil and gas facilities, pulp and paper manufacturers. Not only it is a hard job, the cost of failure is extremely high explosions, blackouts, natural disasters. All kinds of things can happen if the equipment fails. Our inspection robots can perform the job of integrity inspectors safer and much more accurate. Modular construction allows adaptation of robots to the inspected surface. Tanks, pipelines, pressurized vessels, uh, power plant boilers. We can inspect almost any carbon steel asset. A big part of the service is presenting our findings in explicit and actionable form as a heat map of thickness measurements. It allows to communicate the findings across all levels in the organization. Green is nominal, red is critical. You don't have to be an expert to see it. 
This level of specification allows our customers avoid unnecessary repairs, minimize equipment failures, extend equipment lifetime. This is specifically an inspection report of a 275 megawatt boiler inspected by two robots in three shifts. The report includes over four millions of individual data points. Each comes with the corresponding X, Y coordinates and HD photo. We worked with this customer since 2018, and you can see how changes evolve over time and forecasted uh, the expected life of the asset. Another good example, 2300 of an elevated pipeline were inspected from a GLG lift in seven shifts. Minimum preparation was required. We just needed to access elbows and supporting beams to position the robot for inspection. We serve three big verticals, power generation, oil and gas, and pulp and paper. With several of the companies from this list, we have a multi-year service contracts and became preferred entity provider. Our technology allows our customers to obtain full visibility to the health of their assets in a fraction of time of alternative methods. We help asset managers to help to have their assets in their fingertips and use all the benefits of digitization, forecasting, maintenance planning, ensuring the highest safety of the asset and non-stop operations. We are fortunate to have notable and supportive investors and just closed our Series B last December. Not fundraising at the moment, but happy to stay in touch for future rounds. Thank you. Excellent work, guys. Thank you so much for another incredible presentation. Next up, we have LiveEO. LiveEO uses their state-of-the-art ML algorithms to extract valuable insights from satellite images to monitor large-scale infrastructure grids. Hi, I'm Sven, co-founder of LiveEO. Who of you has been affected or knows someone who has been affected by the effects of infrastructure grid failures, such as power outages, wildfires, pipeline leakages, train delays, or train derailments? The reason for all these things are relatively simple. For example, vegetation, which grows, grows too close to overhead lines and catches fire. Pi people building something next to a pipeline and penetrating the pipeline, resulting in pipeline leakages, or small ground disturbances underneath railway tracks, which lead to train derailments. But why do the operators of these infrastructure grids have such a hard time maintaining their grids efficiently? Because there are just so many kilometers of infrastructure grids worldwide. We have more than 40 million kilometers of oil and gas pipelines, electricity grids, and railways across the globe. And these need to be maintained and monitored in an effective way. But currently, they are monitored and maintained in the same way they have been maintained 20 years ago. For example, by walking alongside the grid, driving alongside the grid, or taking a helicopter. A helicopter is a fast method, but still relatively slow if you look at tens of thousands of kilometers of infrastructure grids you monitor, and it's really expensive. But imagine that you can monitor every infrastructure grid in the United States with the click of a button. That's exactly what we're doing at LiveEO. We're taking advantage of the revolution of Earth observation, hundreds of satellites in orbit, and we deal with satellite data end-to-end. -end. That means that we take satellite data from a multitude of operators, heavily pre-process this data, and apply our AI algorithms to it to identify exactly where the infrastructure grids are exposed to external threats, and we input this information directly into the systems of the operators. We identify, for example, where trees grow too close to overhead lines, where the ground underneath, of pi underneath pipelines or railway tracks moves with millimeters accuracy, or we can monitor exactly where people are building something next to a pipeline. But we've seen that the advanced analytics are only one part of the equation. The other one is making these insights actionable. And that's what we do through our own web app and mobile app and through our interfaces into the asset management system, which are already in place at the operators. We are already helping utilities across the globe with the insights of Earth observation data. But let's have a look at one uh, particular use case, 
vegetation management. In the US alone, there are more than six billion, uh, more than six billion US dollars are spent every year on vegetation management. And if you look at an individual company, a lot of these companies spend multi-million euros or dollars per year in vegetation management. And in this use case, the utility, in this case study, the utility had a hard time because they didn't have the real overview over their thousands of kilometers of overhead lines. And it was difficult to coordinate with their subcontractor resulting in low reliability. We help them with our solution by generating a grid-wide overview, optimizing prioritization of different tasks, and this resulted in improved reliability and safety and a reduction of cost of up to 35%. During the plug and pray program, which was shadowed of course by Corona, we've been able to accomplish a lot of things such as signing contracts in Canada, the United States, Europe and talking to utilities across the globe. We're aiming at 1 million euros in revenue this year and we signed strategic alliances with companies such as SAP, Info, Siemens, CDM Smith and AWS to really bring Earth observation data to enterprises. Because our core belief is that every industry can benefit from the insights of Earth observation data and we are at the prime position to really enable this. This entire development has been made possible by the, cutting, by the great team uh, which recruits themselves from cutting-edge academia such as Cambridge, Art, RWTH Aachen and excellent companies across the globe. We have been uh, supported by a seed round from D DVH Ventures and Andreas Kupke, serial entrepreneur, just joined our board. In the past, the European Space Agency or the Ger and the German government believed in our uh, artificial intelligence algorithms and supported the development of these with nearly a million euros. In the future, we will raise our Series A and we will monitor every major infrastructure on the planet. So if your company wants to benefit from the insights of Earth observation data, if your utility wants to keep OPEX reliability and safety and balance, or if your VC fund wants to invest in the leader of Earth observation to enterprise, then I'm happy to talk to you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks so much, guys, for walking us through that presentation today. Next, we have Scanifly. Scanifly has developed a drone-based 3D modeling software that automates engineering workflows for solar energy projects. So please, Scanifly, take us away. Hi, I'm Jason Steinberg, and we are Scanifly. Ten years ago, 0.1% of energy came from solar power. Now it is 2.5%. By 2050, solar energy will be 25% of the world's energy mix. But how will we get there? Solar contractors use a very manual and inefficient process. 91% of solar professionals say that satellite imagery is insufficient to design projects. In many cases, it is outdated, pixelated, and lacks three-dimensional data. As a result, 98% have to visit the project site to verify data, either always or sometimes before a sale is even in place. On site, workers climb ladders, which limits safety and increases insurance premiums. On the roof, surveyors measure everything by hand and do an archaic shading analysis. They then write everything down on paper, and in total, this could take up to a day. This output is then relayed to the designer back at the office. And due to the manual workflow, the installation team often experiences slowdowns and change orders. Solar is expected to grow significantly, but the current manual processes won't enable it to get there. They lead to wasted time, project inaccuracies, and hazardous working conditions, costing solar contractors billions of dollars. Scanifly is automating the solar development process by combining the technologies of drones, 3D modeling, and AI into one platform. We sell software to solar contractors, our customers, to help them develop solar more efficiently, accurately, safely, and at a lower cost. Here's how it works. First, our customers fly a drone on site taking pictures of the site's features. It takes just 15 minutes. Customers can also hire a pilot from Scanifly's third-party pilot network if they don't have a drone. Then they upload the pictures to Scanifly's cloud-based software, and the software creates a virtual replica two-scale 3D model of the site. 
Next, the solar company can create the solar array layout, estimate shading, and conduct other analysis in the software. And then they can export everything to help close a sale, get financial incentives, and create, create construction documents. Here's an example of a final project. And this was actually the same high school that I showed you in the satellite imagery slide. With Canafly, there are many benefits. Solar companies can save up to 90% of their surveying time. They gain near perfect accuracy, and drone data has eight times better resolution than satellite imagery. You can survey up to five times more projects per day. Customers are scaling their business with us and avoiding bottlenecks. Shading analysis, which is important for measuring solar potential, is most accurate with Scanify because we factor in all of the surrounding environment. Our software is the only drone-based tool approved by states across the U.S. And we have the most accurate solution for new builds, which is key in California and other areas where all new construction must have solar. And there are significant savings as well. This is an example like a large commercial project uh, from the prior slides that I showed you. Our business model is to charge each project uploaded to our software under subscription. We currently have customers and interest all over the world, and all of our traction has been inbound as we've never run a marketing campaign. We have several key affiliations. We are part of the leading clean energy incubator in New York City, the Urban Future Lab. We participated in the Clean Tech Open, the largest clean energy accelerator tech program, and also we're joining, we were members of Plug and Place cohort, as you know. Residential and commercial solar in the U.S. is our beachhead market. These companies spend about $2 billion annually on engineering-related work. We have a plan to expand to larger solar developers and asset owners and capture more of the solar value chain. Globally, this figure is $10 billion right now and growing significantly. And lastly, many of our features in our software are transferable to other industries, including utility asset management, vegetation analysis, ag tech, and LIDAR. Our team has over 25 years of combined solar, software, and contracting experience. We've done every job in solar except manufacturing. My colleague John has designed over 2,000 solar projects. I've financed over $3 billion of clean tech assets, and Dennis has developed software and 3D tech for over 10 years. We're in the middle of our seed round right now to expand our team and accelerate sales with the goal of reaching 200 customers and hitting 1 million of ARR. So if you want to shape the leading growing technology platform, in solar and help redefine our world's energy mix, please reach out to me. Thank you. Incredible. Thank you so much for those insights. Incredible. Thank you so much for that overview. Next up, we have Orbital Psychic. Orbital Psychic is speaking to us today about their proprietary analytics platform and satellite monitoring service for the energy sector. So without further ado, let's hear from Orbital Psychic. Hi, my name is Peter Weaver and thank you for being here. Our company, Orbital Sidekick, is deploying a constellation of hyperspectral satellites for daily reporting on the health of industrial operations anywhere on the globe targeting energy infrastructure, especially oil and natural gas. Our initial focus is on pipeline monitoring as we recognize the need and the demand for improved environmental protection and community safety surrounding these assets. Here in the United States, pipeline compliance is commonly achieved by visual aerial observation, maybe weekly, maybe quarterly. This is costly and in most cases provides marginal insight. In addition to our being cost competitive with conventional methods, OSK's three-layer technology solution and compliance alternative includes, first, targeted collection of the highest grade hyperspectral satellite data available. Second, tailored analytics for industry-specific chemical signatures, including chemical fingerprinting, vegetative health, and soil disturbances, plus change over time. And third, we offer actionable, analytical, online reporting through our web portal, which we call Sigma. Plus, we offer clients immediate notice of spills and select findings directly from our satellites. Over the past 18 months, pilot testing has been by aircraft and our prototypes on the International Space Station. This example shows a crude spill from West Texas found by aircraft. Beneath the picture of the leaking tanks is our spectral image highlighting the oil contamination. To the right, you can see spectral profiles of both healthy and contaminated soil pixels. This second example, also by aircraft, is a small underground gas leak in the Midwest. 
The spectral image to the left reveals previously undetected methane indicated by the orange disturbance. A week after cleanup was complete, we observed to the right how hyperspectral imagery can alert operators, in this case, to where the backhoes were pushing dirt. This kind of information is extremely valuable to pipeliners. The third example from the space station last September is OSK imagery over a large fuel spill in the Bahamas following Hurricane Dorian, showing indications of both oil spread and saltwater incursion. And lastly, we've begun already analytical detection of methane using proprietary algorithms and our in-house neural network, all in preparation for our first commercial satellite launch this September to be followed in 2021 by a larger constellation allowing for daily revisits. Our initial focus has been well received by pipeliners and we're proud to have been selected from over 50 proposals as the 2020 technology partner for the iPipe coalition of oil producers. But improved pipeline compliance is just the start. Expanded asset safety and integrity assessments are a natural extension for OSK. And hyperspectral offers much with mineral and new energy exploration, agriculture, and institutional and geopolitical security and safety. We're already seeing interest in each of these areas, even as we maintain startup focus on traditional energy segments. And indeed, COVID is enhancing our offer as we deliver reduced personnel involvement and reduced exposures. OSK is finalizing the logistics of our $16 million Series A funding round, including an additional $16 million in a non-dilutive match from the United States Air Force. This combined $32 million capital infusion will underwrite our launch of six spacecraft for persistent daily client monitoring as we scale up staffing and our signal platform and fully execute on our existing $600 million sales pipeline. We've been proud to be part of the Plug and Play Energy Program. And again, thank you for allowing us to share the incredible capability that Orbital Sidekick has to offer. Incredible. Thank you so much, guys. All right, next up, we have Mission Secure. Mission Secure is an industrial control system cybersecurity company helping their clients prepare and protect against cyber, cyber attacks. So please, let's hear more from Mission Secure's security solution. Thank you, Plug and Play team. Thank you for inviting Mission Secure to the Summer Summit. My name is Kent Pope, and I am the Chief Revenue Officer for Mission Secure. And Mission Secure started off in 2010 as a research project for the U.S. Department of Defense. Basically, they came to University of Virginia and said, how would you stop Stuxnet? And what other kind of risks are there associated with weapon systems and several of the other kind of platforms that they have? Fast forward 2014, and those researchers realized this isn't just a Department of Defense problem. This is actually a worldwide problem with everything that has the OT environments. The OT environments were built with the idea of just got to run, stay operational. And a lot of times they grew and morphed and security was an afterthought. 2018 got some industry backing, obviously Chevron Technologies with EIC and several others. In 2019, we released our first product and landed our first couple of customers and continue to grow from there. The one thing that we really try to stress is the fact that we are an OT company trying to secure OT versus the IT companies that are trying to change their colors and become an OT cybersecurity company. Some of the industries that we play in today, oil and gas, onshore and offshore, manufacturing, maritime, we have a lot of business going in the maritime world. Obviously our Air Force and Navy are very big potential prospects for our product. And then in the plants, whether it be chemical plants, cryogenic plants, whatever kind it is. Anything that has an OT network is a viable customer for Mission Secure and people that we like to try to go in and help secure that network. When you think about the Mission Secure platform, we feel like security in an OT world has to be on-prem. It literally has to be there watching that and monitoring and protecting those devices, those physical pieces of equipment, the infrastructure that is critical to making that power generation or to protecting that vessel, whatever it is. And so our platform comes with a console. The console gives you the visual effects, the configuration, the management of each of the security appliances, the reporting aspect of that. And then we have several other different kinds of security appliances. And those security appliances go all the way down to level zero. 
So when you think about the, the Purdue model and, you know, IT typically is level two and above in that Purdue model and level two and below is more of the OT side. And that's where you get into different protocols in which you would typically see in an IT environment. We go all the way down to level zero where we can actually sit there and monitor the analog digital signals. We can actually connect right up to that device, whether it be a turbine propulsion system or a steering mechanism, pump, valve, whatever. We can actually sit there and connect to that and give some validation to the fact that the HMI shows this valve is open when we're actually showing that the signal shows that the valve is closed. And so there's a problem there and they need to go check that out. And so really alerting and actually being able to do protection, actually be able to prevent signals from going to something that shouldn't be going there. So really kind of trying to go all the way down to that level Z to provide the true security in these OT environments, critical infrastructure environments. Kind of a typical deployment or a, a way that you could kind of visualize how we get deployed. This is for a facilities or buildings control. Basically can see that we have a console, the, the security management system, and we sit there and distribute our appliances, these are hardened appliances that we have, that we distribute those out throughout the network so that we truly do segmentation and make sure that only the right HMI is talking to the right device. That device isn't talking to another device. If it's been compromised, that's when we would see that there's devices talking to other devices that shouldn't be talking. So literally giving that complete visibility of that OT network and who's talking to what and how do they get there and what should they be actually talking about or doing in the process. Uh, and so it's really a very thorough integration throughout the OT network. It is military strength, obviously, since we started with the military and military are some of our good customers, industrial design. So we actually are built to go into those very harsh environments, like in the bottom of a ship or out into a cryogenic facility that's out in the harsh environments, outdoors and stuff like that. Even the system where, you know, we do traffic systems. We have smart cities are some of our customers where we actually go in to the traffic signals and provide an appliance down into those intersections where those traffic signals are sitting there. Our goal is to provide complete visibility and protection, not just the visibility component. There's a lot of players out there that talk about giving you visibility, uh, but they don't do any protection. They don't actually be able to take automated actions. We look at that as kind of like the cop at the door saying, hey, there's somebody inside your house. You have fun finding them. Well, we want to be the cop at the door with the guy in handcuffs saying, you know, he tried to get in. We stopped him. Let's go prosecute. With that, if you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to Mission Secure. Once again, my name is Kent Pope. Thanks and have a great day. Awesome work, guys. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Helios Exchange. Helios is an online platform that develops and delivers energy efficient retrofits for commercial buildings with ease. Hi, my name is Pierre Trevet. I'm the founder and CEO of Helios Exchange. We provide the world's first software as a service platform to streamline, accelerate, and scale energy efficiency projects in buildings. So buildings are all around us. In fact, they consume 40% of the world's energy use and contribute the same amount to carbon emissions. One third of this energy consumed, in fact, could be saved through proven technology and economically viable projects. The problem is there are multiple barriers to prevent scalability of this resource. Prime of these are siloed information, that does not circulate among all those stakeholders who work on the buildings, lack of standardization, high transaction costs, and many more. We at Helios Exchange, we provided a platform to streamline the end-to-end -end process to analytics and energy management solutions through a software as a service platform. We provide a platform allowing building owners, energy service providers to discover the energy savings potential. We develop a unique technology that allows us to create a, a digital twin on how a building consumes energy and that allows us to identify energy savings opportunity to projects such as relamping with LED and, and lighting controls, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, uh, retrofits to highly efficient systems, smart building energy analytics, building emission systems, distributed energy power, solar and storage, and the like. And uh, our technology allows for scoping the projects from an energy reduction standpoint, from an energy engineering standpoint, and doing a business case via an economic analysis and financial solution analysis software. Um, we also have a unique way to simulate the performance risk of those projects to be able to bring confidence, ensure the savings, and facilitate the financing of the projects through multiple ways, including third-party financing. And then we monitor the projects all the way through and through. Thanks to our platform, by integrating all the 
key building energy analytics and data, we're able to automate the process end to end. And the net result is to eliminate the upfront cost, the upfront barrier, sorry, to the renovation projects, increase the project conversion rates, and reduce the transaction costs. So we've been able to deploy this approach over the building stock of entire cities. In fact, we cover over 20 large cities in the US and that amount to about 20 billion square feet of real estate, representing about $44, $54 billion in annual energy costs. And we already identified over 13 billion in annual energy savings to projects run through the platform. Uh, if you look at the market for energy retrofits today, it's about a $75 billion dollar market growing to steady to grow to 100 billion by 2025 and that's accelerated by a whole slew of regulation uh, chief of which in Europe the goal of the EU is to impose 70 percent energy reduction in buildings by 2050 and that there's a need for about uh, half a trillion dollars in investment and California has similar mandates uh, calling for doubling the energy efficiency of the building stock in California by 2050 so all around that is really creating a massive drive for energy retrofits. We are, through our technology, we're slaying to grow the business to about $50 million in revenue by year five. And that's, uh, you know, based on where we are today, around 300K uh, revenue year one. There's been a bit curtailed because of COVID, but we expect a very strong growth, uh, especially benefiting from the Green New Deal in Europe that, uh, that wants to stimulate the economy through green projects, uh, including in buildings. Uh, we have a seasoned team, uh, founders have known each other for decades, uh, and we're already starting to get very strong acclaims in Europe, including at VivaTech, we uh, won uh, Vinci's Energy Digital Healthcare Sh Challenge last year. Uh, we were number two at the uh, Greater Paris uh, uh, City Digitalization Project, and uh, second prize as well with Schneider Electric. We already have a lot of customers, including with the City of Paris, uh, with energy service companies such as Engie, Dalkia, Vinci Energies, and with real estate uh, companies like ICAD in France, which is one of the largest commercial real estate owners. We're doing a $3 million Series A round. Uh, that's on top of uh, 770K that we raised today in Seed Money. We're a fully operational platform, um, really covering a lot of buildings. We're a software-driven deal flow uh, powered by proprietary algorithm. And uh, we are raising money to be able to scale this approach, deploy their platform at scale in Europe uh, and be able to make a dent in that $100 billion market. So thank you for your interest. We're ready to talk to you and tell you more about this opportunity. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for being here with us today and sharing more about Helios. Last but not least, I would love to introduce you all to Toku Systems. Toku is here to tell us more about their industrial IoT platform, working to empower today's oil and gas producers to protect the environment while cutting costs and reducing risks. Hello, and thank you for joining us. We are Toku Systems, empowering operations with digital visibility. Upstream oil and gas producers, now more than ever, are finding themselves needing to operate in increasingly low price environments with much higher production standards. In order to be, to be successful in this environment, producers must do more with the resources they have. Automated monitoring is a natural technique to leverage existing capabilities, but traditional automation solutions are not able to help. Traditional systems are neither affordable nor scalable. They're too complex and costly to deploy and maintain, and the quality of data is typically too poor to deliver the necessary insights for driving efficiency gains. If you look at the overall oil and gas market landscape, you'll notice the downstream is far more digitized than the upstream. In fact, 90% of upstream wells and pipelines have no digital visibility coverage, and this segment accounts for about 60% of total production revenue. This is our target market focus, and this start market size is about $10 billion. The industry clearly needs better digital visibility into their upstream production operations. We do have some applications in the midstream, but our focus is the upstream. Togu offers a seamless end-to-end -end solution combining hardware, software, and service components. We're not just hardware, not just a cloud service, not just software, we're all of them in one. There are four key differentiators of our system that make us truly unique compared to current alternatives. We're bringing simplicity, versatility, quality, and accessibility. And I'll get into more detail in a minute. From the hardware side, we're an all-in-one package. We combine communications, power, and sensors all in one, and the device is rated for hazardous zones, meaning it can be installed anywhere in oil and gas. 
With traditional remote monitoring solutions, each piece would typically be separate and would require a design group, fabrication group, and installation group all working together to implement a solution like this. But with our system, it only took about two weeks for two people to install 120 devices on their operations. A traditional automation solution, this would take about 10 weeks to do. Our system is also extremely versatile. This one device can be installed on pump jacks, pipelines, or tanks for a variety of upstream applications. The system is an end-to-end -end monitoring system that puts the high quality data captured by our hardware directly into the hands of our customers. Users can visualize and analyze their data then through either our system, our web and smartphone applications, or their own systems. We offer third-party systems integration capabilities where customers can take their data into their existing systems and analyze it there, often with other parts of their operations. The quality of our data that we deliver is unprecedented. We're delivering per second, high resolution data that is time synchronized to the network and temperature compensated for accuracy. This provides our customers with a much better, much clearer degree of visualization into their fluid dynamics that enables them to see inside their operations in a way they never could before. They can characterize and diagnose their problems faster and develop solutions and optimize their operations faster. The platform is scalable and comes with plug and play options on both the hardware and software ends. Our system can be installed on the pipelines, pump jacks and tanks for these applications, pipeline operations and integrity, for assessing pump performance, for leak detection, and remote tank level monitoring. Using our system, our customers have been able to increase their production, reduce their downtime by five to 10%, and mitigate operational risks. We've helped customers catch leaks by alerting them to when and where they happen. For one of our customers, they were able to increase the production in one of their lines by 25 to 30%. We're a team of highly skilled professionals with over 160 years of combined experience. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Toku, for a great close to our first ever virtual summer summit. And for everyone joining us online, please join me in giving the last 18 batch startups a round of applause virtually. Woo! All right, that concludes our startup portion of the event. I look forward to meet, chatting with you all in our chat rooms. I will pass it off to my colleague, Wade, who will now talk to you more about how to use Prella. Thank you so much again for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you all again in person soon. Fantastic, Noreen. Thank you so much, and congratulations to all the participating startups for the amazing work you're doing to bring digital innovation and reduce carbon emissions. We look forward to hearing more about the projects that emerge from this. And, and this is hopefully the beginning of our relationship for future opportunities. So we'll take the viewers feedback and announce the startup winner of People Choice Award in our LinkedIn page. So if you'd like to know who is gonna win this award, uh, we will share a link here in our chat box. Go ahead and click on it, follow us there. Uh, we'll be making a lot of announcements moving forward. So with that, uh, you know, as the tradition of our program would have it, we would like to recognize one of our uh, partners that have been most uh, active in the past few months and the work that they're doing and, uh, you know, give them a corporate innovation award every summit. Um, so the semi-annual corporate innovation award of batch six energy expo goes to Osaka Gas. So we've been really excited to be working with Osaka Gas in the past uh, four years. Uh, and, you know, we want to give this opportunity to our champion and our main point of contact here at Osaka Gas in uh, Silicon Valley, Mr. Junji Yoshida, to talk a little bit about some of their activities and some of the effort that they're putting in to uh, help liaise the two networks. And, and really that we, we are very grateful to see that their participation in plug and play activities across different verticals uh, to source startups for the US subsidiaries and various business units in Japan has increased and they also have expanded their open innovation activities uh, overseas since 2019. They also have had multiple uh, merger and acquisitions like in oil and gas, they um, acquired the company and in renewables, they, uh, they invest in a US solar project developer, Sol America, and also they, they're planning on investment in Igloo, a British household energy supplier. So with that little introduction, 
I want to pass it over to our uh, friend and champion, Mr. Junji Yoshida. Hi, I'm Junji, Junji Yoshida of Osaka News. Thank you, Program Play Team, for supporting us since the inception of Energy Program. Also, thank you for startup from Energy Program Batch 6 for your great efforts. It's a great honor to be able to accept this award on behalf of Osaka Gas Group. We Osaka Gas look at innovation as a critical driver to grow our company. And innovation ecosystem at Prague and Play is an excellent source for us to reach out to startups in various fields, such as smart cities, industrial IoTs, enterprise software, cybersecurity, and of course, energy and sustainability. Today, taking this opportunity, I would like to introduce our open innovation tech scouting activity. Please go on your Google, search or second us open innovation or visit this URL. And click on the technical needs button at the bottom. Then you can see the list of our needs. And click the title in which you are interested. Then you can see the details. We are really looking forward to collaborating with not only startups, but also large enterprises. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much again, Junji-san, and it's been great working with you and look forward to be able to see you in person. Um, so as a final closing remark, there, needless to say, our teams are broader plug and play are working on a number of events uh, to help our startups to help them with business development activities. And the event that I'm particularly excited about uh, is the one that's coming up on June 25th around innovation in carbon capture and utilization and storage. And this is an area that we feel can help us reach our carbon neutrality goals and help the heavy industries to reduce their carbon emissions. So we will be featuring great speakers and startups. So if you have your phone, you can go ahead and scan the QR code right here or click on that link that Arsh just shared with you to register for this event. And lastly, as a reminder, uh, this was brought up in the fireside chat with Said and Barbara. We, we try our best to, you know, create this networking environment for our startups, investors, and corporations to come and engage. We have a networking session coming up right after. So uh, the link here is shared. Uh, please go ahead and feel free to, uh, you know, chat with our startups. The links are shared here in the chat box again. And uh, it was brought up to my attention that one of uh, our partners' logos were missed from one of the slides. We also would like to recognize the work that our uh, clients in DCP Tech Ventures Group have been doing in the past few years, and we're really excited to have them on board. Uh, since 2017, we've been working with them as a founding anchor partner in our energy and sustainability practice here in Silicon Valley. So uh, we want to close it out. Thank you all for tuning in. Feel free to go ahead and share your LinkedIn page network here and also join us in the Brella app uh, networking session and have a great rest of the day.